Uh, good morning, everyone. It is 8 o'clock. We'll get started here in a moment. Well, welcome everyone to day last. We have two administrative matters on the agenda today. Before we start, I will turn to Executive Director Chuck Tracy for any announcements. Sorry about that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, you're correct, we have two administrative items left our membership appointments and COPs and future council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, so uh, just uh, looking forward to finishing off the day, uh, finishing off the meeting. Just want to say, while well, I got everybody on the line. Thanks for uh, everybody on the uh, council and advisory bodies and, and the public who all made this meeting go smoothly. Uh, I think your uh, reports came in uh, really well, so thanks to the advisory bodies and the secretarial staff for that. Um, the uh, council discussion was uh, was uh, concise and uh, and good, and um, public comment as well. So uh, I think everybody contributed to that, to having a, a good, smooth meeting. And um, so we we'll just hope to finish it off that way. And um, Look forward to talking to you all again in March. That's all, Mr. Chair. All right, thanks very much, Chuck. So we'll get started without any further delay on C7, membership appointments and council operating procedures. And I'll look to Mark, uh, rather Mike Berner to get us going. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, council members. Yes, it's item C7. Uh, this is the uh, usual slot where the council considers appointments to the council and its advisory bodies, standing committees, et cetera, as well as any changes to council operating procedures. Uh, there's a fair bit of business to take care of here today, so indulge me a bit of time and I'll walk through uh, the task list as I see it and happy to take any questions. Um, uh, first off, I'll start with uh, council officers, members, and designees in your briefing materials in a supplemental attachment. One for this agenda item, there's a letter from National Marine Fishery Service uh, identifying Mr. Lyle Enriquez as a new NIMS designee for the council seat. There's uh, no further action from the council needed on this one, and uh, we look forward to Lyle's participation on the council floor. Regarding standing council member committees and representatives to other forums, uh, Ms. Dorothy Lohman uh, is currently the council's appointed commissioner to the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, uh, and Ms. Krista Svensson is uh, a designated alternate. Uh, Dorothy Lohman uh, plans to resign her appointment after the December meeting of the commission. Uh, but she can, plans to continue to represent the United States as the Inter-American Tropical Tuna co-chair of the IATTC and Western Central Pacific Commission Northern Committee Joint Working Group on Bluefin Tuna. Uh, so it'll be good to continue to work with Dorothy. We appreciate her service uh, as commissioner, uh, but it's my understanding the council would like to get the process started of getting Ms. Svensson's uh, presidential appointment going. So unless we hear otherwise from the council, council staff is prepared after this meeting to draft up a letter uh, to the State Department to get that uh, lengthy process started. So uh, regarding uh, the Council's representation to the International Pacific Halibut Commission, uh, it's my understanding we might have a bit of a scheduling conflict with upcoming IPHC meetings, uh, and so there might be some dis Council discussion uh, regarding that situation as when we get to Council discussion. Regarding Council advisory body appointments, we have a variety of seats to fill uh, on the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. Ms. Gillian Lyons has resigned her conservation position as of this meeting. Uh, she let us know that uh, back earlier in the fall. So following the September meeting, we opened that position up for nominations. We got two very strong candidates, Ms. Stephanie Webb, a PhD candidate in the environmental studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Ms. Anna Weinstein, the Marine Conservation Director of the National Audubon Society. Uh, and so the council will look to the council discussion and a council motion uh, for that appointment when we get to that point in the agenda. 
Regarding the ground fish management team, National Marine Fishery Service Northwest Fishery Science Center has nominated Dr. Chantel Wetzel to fill the vacant National Marine Fishery Service, or excuse me, uh, Northwest Fishery Science Center position on the GMT. Additionally, the National Marine Fishery Service West Coast Region has nominated Ms. Gretchen Hanchu and Mr. Daniel Stute to replace Ms. Abigail Harley and Ms. Karen Palmagino uh, as their two rep representatives on the GMT. Uh, again, we'll need a motion for that one. As well, in your supplemental materials, there was uh, nomination materials for Ms. Catherine Pearson to replace Patrick Myrick uh, as an ODFW representative on the groundfish management team. Regarding the groundfish endangered species work group, uh, the council received two supplemental nominations regarding uh, membership for this group. Regarding the ODFW position, uh, there's a nomination materials from the from the department nominating Ms. Lynn Mattis to fill a vacancy on, on that group for ODFW. And regarding uh, the Southwest Fishery Science Center and the sea turtle taxa expert on that group, uh, the center is requesting the council consider Ms. Scott, Mr. Scott Benson replacing uh, Dr. Tomo Aguchi for, for that position. Uh, all of those that I just went through for the GMT, the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group, and the CPS Advisory Subpanel uh, would need council motions to formalize those appointments uh, here today if that's the direction the council would like to go. Um, also, which came to light uh, rather recently regarding the ground fish electronic monitoring ad hoc groups we have, we have both a technical and policy advisory committee. Uh, we were informed regarding the GEM TAC that the office, NIMS Office of Law Enforcement would like to replace Mr. Brian Corrigan with Mr. Andrew Torres. Uh, and regarding the GEM PAC, uh, we heard from Mr. Howard McElderry that uh, he would like uh, Mr. Mike Orcutt, both those gentlemen from Archipelago Group, uh, he'd like Mike Orcutt to replace him moving forward on the GEM PAC. Uh, I would note that the, as an ad hoc group, both of these appointments would be uh, at the discretion of Chair Gorelnik. Uh, and unless we hear something different around the table, I think Mark's prepared to, to make those appointments if that's uh, what he hears from the council. Uh, I would also just note uh, there is a bit of a, a connection here with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, enforcement consultant situation. As everyone's aware, Bob Buccinelli retired this summer. CDFW uh, has uh, has been working on a, a replacement for Bob on the EC. Uh, we've there's been uh, um, some good alternate representation there, but that also results in a vacancy on the GEMTAC, and we'd look to California somewhere down the road to permanently fill those seats, but. Uh, for this session, I think uh, the OLE seat and the uh, seat that Archipelago Group Group has been uh, helping the council out with on the gem pack are up for uh, Chair Garonic's consideration. Uh, one last thing I would mention on uh, council advisory groups is that uh, recall at the September meeting, the council had a fair amount of discussion about offshore development, and there was uh, interest from several folks in the council family to consider uh, perhaps a, a new advisory group that would handle those types of issues, uh, proposals for wind energy or aquaculture, et cetera. Uh, so the council uh, tasked uh, some members of the public to draw up a proposal in that regard for council consideration at this meeting. So under your public comments, uh, under the supplemental public comments, we got a proposal from uh, Mr. Mike Conroy and Ms. Corey Writings uh, as a follow-up to that, that September discussion. So that's in the briefing book uh, for your, your consideration. Uh, regarding council operating procedures at the time of the briefing book, there really we didn't really have anything we anticipated. Uh, as you recall, under a couple of our CPS agenda items earlier this week, there were some comments regarding the need to revisit our council operating procedures regarding uh, procedures for the consideration of exempted fishing permits, as well as the COPs for uh, methodology reviews, all four of our FMPs. Uh, have standalone operating procedures for these two categories. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, although there was some good discussion on the floor earlier in the week, there, there isn't anything really for consideration for final council adoption here at this meeting, uh, but there was a task to council staff to look at those methodologies uh, and see uh, where they need revision or updating or, or improvement. So uh, council, uh, plan, council staff plans to leave this meeting with that task and look to that coming back at a future council meeting uh, when that might be ready for council uh, consideration for adoption. Um, so uh, additionally, I guess I would also just point out that we have two uh, advisory body groups that submitted supplemental reports for this agenda item. Uh, we have the HMS advisory subpanel, and it's my understanding Mr. Mike Conroy is prepared to give that report to you when we get to that 
stage of the agenda item. Uh, and we have a supplemental gap report, uh, and Ms. Susan Chambers is prepared to uh, give you that report. Uh, I would also note that under public comment, we have three folks, three different signups there, uh, including the two individuals I mentioned that were proponents of the proposal to have a new committee regarding offshore development. Uh, and so I presume they're prepared to speak to uh, the written materials they put in your supplemental uh, public comment uh, regarding that, that proposal for a new committee. So. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I believe those are all of the task lists that I wanted to go through. Again, we would look to the Council for motions regarding uh, nominations to the CPSAS, the GMT, and the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group. Um, and there's a little bit of work to, uh, for Mr. Gorelnik, if so chooses to uh, make a few changes to our Ground Fish Electronic Monitoring Groups. Uh, and then whatever Council discussion ensues regarding uh, potential future COP changes or the new uh, committee uh, work down the road. I'd also entertain any questions or comments from the council on that. So with that, Mr. Chair, sorry that was a lot of information, but uh, I hope that was helpful and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Mike. Yes, we have a fair amount of business to do here, but hopefully we can uh, go through it smoothly. Uh, before going to reports, let me see if there are any questions uh, from the from around the table here. And I'm not seeing any, and Mike, I'm sure you'll keep us on the straight and narrow once it comes time for a uh, council discussion. Make sure we tick all our boxes. I will so do my best. Okay. We have two reports, uh, HMS AS and the GAP, uh, I, as, as Mike indicated. Uh, so Mike Conroy, uh, please provide the HMS AS report. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Just confirming you can hear me. Yes. Wonderful. Hopefully my internet connection is a little bit better today. Um, I'm, my name is Mike Connor for the HMS AS. I'll be reading our supplemental HMS, HMS AS report one for agenda item C7. During your September meeting, you heard from the HMS AS and a number of other advisory bodies that you, you should consider setting up a committee focused on offshore development in response to activities taking place with offshore wind and aquaculture. This would allow for better coordination with federal and state agencies involved in those processes and allow industry and other interested stakeholders an opportunity to keep informed about efforts proposed in waters under the council's jurisdiction. The AS continues to fully support this and recommends you take whatever necessary steps to create such a committee during this meeting. And that concludes our statement. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Mike. Any questions for Mike on that concise statement? Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mike, for that co concise statement. Uh, so that gives me the opportunity to, to jump in and to uh, to ask you uh, what kind of support from industry have you received? Uh, what various fisheries uh, are she to be interested in this? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for that question, Louis. Um, as you well know, th this will, you know, offshore wind and aquaculture would impact just about every fishery that's involved in the, the council manages, uh, either directly or indirectly. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with folks from various different fisheries, and, and they are most interested in this. And I think that as you saw during the September meeting, you know, a lot of, most of all of the ABs weighed in on, in support of this as well. So I, I think, I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. It seems like we have a sort of a rising tide here of interest uh, uh, um, on the coast for this. Thank you. All right. Any further questions? Thank you, Mike. And I know we'll be hearing from you shortly in public comment. Uh, Susan Chambers with the GAP report, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just want to do a mic check. You're coming through loud and clear. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Susan Chambers uh, from the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel, and I will be reading Supplemental Gap Report 1. The Groundfish Advisory Subpanel reviewed the documents under this agenda item and documents from prior council meetings related to the issue brought forward in public comment by Ms. Corey Ridings of Ocean Conservancy and Mr. Mike Conroy of Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations and has the following recommendations regarding the Offshore Projects Committee. 
Ms. Writings and Mr. Conroy suggest creating either an ad hoc or a standing committee to tackle primarily offshore wind energy issues. The GAP understands the impacts of offshore development to fisheries is a clear and present concern. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and some state processes leave little room for seafood industry engagement outside of elected officials or agency representatives. Therefore, it is critical for fishery participants to be aware of and engage in offshore energy development activities early and often. The principal power project, originally planned for the Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas project off of Coos Bay, Oregon, but later split off as an independent wind farm project, set a clear precedent for how not to plan an offshore energy development project. And fishery participants are grateful that after collective 11th hour effort by the seafood industry and state legislature, that project was disbanded. However, it set a clear example for why fishery participants should have meaningful engagement at the earliest stages of project development. <clears throat> Excuse me. In this vein, the comment letter outlining the need for a Council Offshore Development Committee is clearly a well-intentioned recommendation. However, the gap is grappling with how the Council can optimally engage with offshore energy proponents as well as BOEM and other agencies in a meaningful way to prepare for and respond to proposed offshore development activities. It is not clear to the gap if establishing a new council committee is the best means to ensure stakeholder engagement about this topic for several reasons. This type of cross fishery management plan issue would require representation from numer numerous fisheries as well as agency staff with varied expertise, resulting in a large, potentially cumbersome committee. The form and function of the committee is unclear. It has been suggested that such a committee could be the eyes and ears of the council to keep council members and fishery participants apprised of offshore development activities. But that seems a role better suited for council staff in their work with their, respect with their respective advisory bodies and for the council. It is also unclear what types of recommendations and or work products would be produced by this type of committee and how their output would be used by the council, who has a limited role in the offshore development arena. The gap suggests the Habitat Committee might be the appropriate council committee to track these issues for the council family in general, and that council staff could monitor development activities that could have specific effects in their respective advisory bodies. For example, the GAP and the Habitat Committee have tracked these projects over the years and advised the Council of potential areas of intersection. The Council has responded with recommendations and or letters to other agencies suggesting changes to proposed research, increasing awareness of the ocean habitat and ecosystems, and potential effects to the fishing industry. This has proven effective in the past and continued engagement of this kind is essential. Moreover, Various levels of engagement on local and state levels are already occurring. As the Council noted at its September 2020 meeting, Council Member Dr. Karen Braby, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, is a member of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, Oregon Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. Habitat Committee Member Mr. Eric Wilkins, <clears throat> with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, is a member of the BOEM California Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force. Several other advisory body members who are also engaged in trade associations, associations or processes relating to offshore energy. In addition, the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance recently formed a West Coast branch and is paying close attention to these issues. It is well equipped to provide industry engagement on West Coast offshore development activities. To summarize, the GAP clearly recognizes the importance of the seafood industry, the Council, and more specifically, the National Marine Fisheries Service, to be engaged in any agency discussion about permitting proposed competing offshore uses, particularly offshore wind, and the potential for significant fishery disruptions from those projects. It is imperative the Council and its advisory bodies remain vigilant to these issues, complementing any state or local efforts. The GAP believes council committees should have a clear purpose, function, and justification for expending council time and resources to staff them. Given the information available, it seems premature to form this committee at this time. 
the gap is comfortable with continued engagement by the Habitat Committee in covering offshore energy projects and for council staff to track these projects and provide information to their respective advisory bodies as warranted. Regarding a cost recovery committee, the GAP supports formation of a cost recovery committee as discussed on the council floor under agenda item G.2, National Marine Fisheries Service report earlier at this meeting. And that concludes our report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Susan. Are there any questions for Susan? Louis Zim. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. And thank you very much, Susan. I very much miss being working with you in the gap. And uh, I, I obviously would have had something to say if I'd been in the gap on this matter. But the only thing I really have is a question for you as to the sense of the gap. Is, is the gap satisfied with uh, what we have done so far in informing uh, the Council uh, of Ocean Development, or do they feel that uh, we need to uh, somehow up our game? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Zim, Mr. Chair, um, the GAP did have a lot of discussion on this. Um, we spent a lot of time on it. Um, there is a lot of concern by GAP members that the, the council does need to do more, needs to be more engaged, um, and that the council should up its game, as you, as you say. However, we're just not clear on the process. Um, that has been what we were struggling with, but in general, yes. Um, the industry does need to, the industry is looking for a way for the council to become more engaged. Um, it's a very important issue. There's very real threat and um, we would like to see some, the council work on this somehow. We're just not sure that a committee right now is the proper way to do that. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. I think that uh, illuminates very much the good work that you do in the gap and the, the thoughtful discussions that you had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any further questions on the GAP report? Not seeing any hands. Susan, thank you very much. Thank you. And that will take us to public comment. And I'm going to receive a request uh, from public commenters here. So I'm first going to call on uh, Corey Ridings and Mike Conroy. Good morning, Mr. Chair, council members. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Corey Reinings with Ocean Conservancy, and I'm with my friend and colleague, Mike Conroy with PCFFA. We're speaking together today to encourage the council to create a committee to address offshore development, specifically wind energy, wave energy, aquaculture, and other potential offshore activities that might affect council managed species, fisheries, and their habitats and ecosystems, as well as the communities that rely upon those. Offshore development is planned for renewable energy and aquaculture, and it is foreseeable that other activities, including but not limited to oil and gas extraction and mining, will be proposed for the outer continental shelf. Proactive, thoughtful, and inclusive planning engagement is needed to ensure that our fisheries and ecosystem are protected. Engaging fishermen, fishery industry members, and the conservation community in a public and transparent manner should be non-optional before offshore development occurs. And to date, this has been lacking. BOEM has already identified call areas for offshore energy development, two off the Central California coast, one off the Northern California coast, and one is imminent off the Oregon coast, likely south of Cape Blanco. And we also know of an offshore wave research lease, which has been issued off the coast of Oregon as well. How many of you are aware that there are two proposed offshore wind projects in California state and waters near Port Arguello, a very important area for salmon, DPS, and groundfish fisheries? In addition to a recently released data tool provided by the BOEM Oregon Task Force, which has dad fisheries data from as far back as 2010, and in some cases only data as recently as 2010. Wind energy will disrupt data collection, altering time series data sets used for stock assessment and ecosystem assessment. 
the loss of habitat, both from turbines and their footings, from the transmission cables, is substantial and has impacts on stocks, other species, the ecosystem, and how people will be able to fish. As the council has already discussed, aquaculture opportunity areas were announced for Southern California and various mariculture and fin fish farm proposals continue to pop up. The concerns with fin fish aquaculture are many, including pressures to wild caught fisheries, both direct through degradation of the natural environment and threats to stocks through competition in the market. All of these activities will have substantial, meaningful impacts on our fisheries, the ecosystem they rely on, and the communities which are dependent upon both, and they do not stand in isolation. They have cumulative impacts to the environment and our fisheries, making council engagement principally important as the stakeholder group that uniquely understands these impacts and what they mean to our West Coast fisheries as a whole. These projects need to be considered within the larger context of how West Coast fisheries can, and communities operate and what they need to be sustainable. We want to be very clear here that the formation of this committee is not intended to stop or block these developments. Some of these activities have merit and in addition to sustainable wild caught fisheries may be reasonable and prudent uses of our ocean. However, folks who care about fisheries need to be at the decision making table from the beginning, not as an afterthought, not as a box check, but as meaningful participants who are, provide, who are providing seafood or catching fish for fun, subsistence or culture. Wild caught fisheries are not just an integral part of local economies, but cornerstones of communities and meaningful to millions of Americans on the West Coast and across the nation. Fishery participants are also some of the most knowledgeable people about the ocean and its uses, and this knowledge should be shared as the decisions are made. While the Council, an advisor to NIMPS, does not have direct jurisdiction over these offshore developments, the Council has an important role to play. Consultations, letters to various government agencies or groups, as a member of any regional ocean planning body, providing documentation of your views as representatives of the fisheries and the ecosystems you are charged with sustaining, and as a public note of fisheries issues and a convener of experts and stakeholders in fisheries management and science. To help achieve this, a committee that can keep the council and its stakeholders updated and educated on developing offshore projects and support the council towards having a voice in associated processes would be highly valuable. We recommend that the council create an advisory subpanel under COP2 or a management team under COP3 to consider and address impacts to council managed fisheries, fishing communities, and the ecosystem. We appreciate and acknowledge the concerns raised by the gap. And quite frankly, that is why specifics and details are not included in our written request. More on that later. I, I wish I could sit here and tell you we have the luxury of time. We don't. The Ocean-Based Climate Solution Act, which we discussed yesterday, under Section 312, requires the permitting of 12.5 gigawatts of offshore wind energy in the U.S. by 2025 and 25 gigawatts by 2030. 2016 study estimates that 13, what, 1,351 square miles is necessary to produce 7 gigawatts. Oh, and since offshore wind is a commercial extractive activity, this would have to be this would have to coexist with other commercial extractive activities, fishing, aquaculture, et cetera, in the 70 cent 70 percent of where those activities won't be banned. During your September meeting, the Habitat Committee, the EAS, CPSAS, and both the HMS, AS, and MT all supported forming a committee to ensure that these issues were adequately addressed. We recommend that the committee identify and report to the council on specific proposals for or activities which may, may lead to developments on the outer continental shelf in waters off the states of California, Washington, and Oregon. Report to the council on potential impacts to and or conflicts with council managed fisheries, fishing communities, and the ecosystem, and the council's ability to achieve OI on an ongoing basis. Draw on the knowledge and expertise of other advisory bodies as necessary to carry out committee duties. Meet and report to the council no fewer than twice per year, and as necessary, specific proposals are announced or activities held, noting that offshore development initiatives and proposals can emerge quickly and out of cycle with council meeting schedules. Thus, committee meetings may require the flexibility to meet virtually in line with public, meetings, public meeting notice requirements. Support council staff in the development and maintenance of a council webpage, noticing updates, council action, and public notices pertaining to offshore development. We realize the council's formation of this committee would necessarily involve questions of the makeup of such. We struggled with the initial composition of this committee, in particular keeping it small enough so that it is manageable, yet large enough so that all interested stakeholders feel as if they have a voice and an opportunity to be heard. We suspect the following user groups should be represented. State and federal government agencies, 
fishery and processor participants, environmental conservation organizations, tribes, and the public. If the council opts to create this committee, we suggest the council's advisory bodies, interested stakeholders, and the public be given opportunity to weigh in on the committee's makeup before finalizing in early 2021. Regarding process, we recommend that the council vote to approve the formation of a committee at this meeting and work with council staff over the winter to develop implementing COP language for consideration at the March 2021 meeting. Assuming finalization then, the council can then advertise for committee membership and make appointments either at the April or June meetings. As part of the committee formation process, we recommend a peer-to-peer -peer or council to council advisory process where the Mid-Atlantic or New England councils support PFMC efforts. Both council regions face rapid offshore development and have created council mechanisms to address the growing sustainable fisheries challenges associated. They can share best practices or lessons learned toward council and fishery stakeholder engagement and help us avoid reinventing the wheel. You will hear from Rhoda and hope you will ask questions about how the Mid-Atlantic and Northeast councils have chosen to engage in the offshore development processes. Thank you for your time and consideration and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, uh, thanks very much, Corey and Mike. Uh, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, Mike, for the, the great presentation there. It's pretty thorough, and I don't have a lot of questions, but I, the main question I do have is, could you just give us your thoughts on why, why not the Habitat Committee or the Ecosystem Committee taking this task on? It, it seems like they kind of deal with that anyhow, and I just... Uh, how do you? What are your What are your thoughts on how that how this committee would be uh, different and how it would be additive to the process and, and informative to the council in a way that the uh, habitat or ecosystem committee isn't already? Um, thanks, Mr. Dooley, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I, the habitat committee and the ecosystem committees both supported in September some letters supporting this creation of this committee. And my understanding of it is simply its bandwidth, that both of those committees are already pretty full with what they have to do already and see value to this and bringing in additional capacity to this in the sense that they aren't able to do that sort of as things are today. Um, also, I'd like to note that I think that you know, all committees would be encouraged to weigh in on this. Well, a new committee would be able to sort of be the point folks on this and be able to bring issues to the council and other AB's attention. Um, in my mind, at least, we would fully expect other committees, especially those like the Habitat and Ecosystem, that do have um, special expertise on them, to also be able to comment and weigh in and work with the new committee on identifying these important issues and bringing them to the council attention. Further questions of Corey and Mike. Marcy Gramko, followed by Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Corey and Mike. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm hoping you'll help me out here with a little bit of scenario playing. Um, you described the new call areas and how quickly they've emerged and how important it is for the council to engage in the decision making. Um, but I'm struggling because I don't see that the council has a role really in the decision making. Um, we have an ability to comment, but um, I'm hoping you can play out for me. Let's let's say that this committee existed. Um, why don't you and I know you've said that the specific details of the role and the formation of the committee uh, were not included here in the proposal um, because I'm assuming that means you're leaving it to the council to figure out. Um, but I'm just hoping that um, maybe you can play out for us uh, if the committee did exist, um, what would be happening with regard to these new call areas? What would be the engagement we'd be doing and who would be doing it specifically yeah thank you uh, through the chair thank you mr ramco for that question uh, you know using history as a guide when the call areas were announced off the california coast there was very little if any outreach done to any stakeholders that utilize the the oceans 
for either fishing or enjoyment or whatnot. They went to the local ports and harbors, made some presentations, got some buy-in through some contractual obligations, but they didn't, they, they didn't reach out to other fisheries that utilize those areas. It is my hope that with the council involved early in the process, uh, they, they would know which fisheries utilize the areas in questions and could help inform BOEM and others along the way that, hey, in addition to you know doing the outreach that you've done to the Morro Bay folks or the Port San Luis folks, you know, reach out to the ground fish folks that aren't based there, reach out to the HMS folks that utilize the areas that aren't based there, reach out to the CPS folks that will be imp impacted because they fish in the area where the cables will run ashore. I just think a centralized location wherein all the council managed fisheries and all members of the council family can have a, uh, knowledge of a, uh, of, of a proposal and learn the best ways to participate, become engaged early often, I think will save us from where we are now. Because I think, I think Baum is realizing that how they've approached it since 2018 hasn't necessarily been working. And they might be trying to reinvent the wheel, but we, you know, I think it could have it could have made the process much easier and sped things along across the board had it been addressed and dealt with earlier. And I hope that answers your question. Any, any follow up there, Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I I guess. Um, if I may, um, is it your feeling then that Boom isn't aware that the council exists now and a committee will help them know we exist? Through the chair, thanks, Mr. Ranko, for that question as well. No, I know, I know that Boom knows that the council exists. I know that Boom comes in and advises the council on a semi regular basis, but I am unaware that Boom does any outreach to the council in planning for citing discussions or or things like that I, I i i would hope that they do but i can't say for certain that they do uh you. louis you had your hand up uh, but it's down now did you have something uh no i don't marcy covered it thank you all right uh any uh further questions of corey and mike uh, I've got one. Um, uh, Corey and Mike, you had mentioned that uh, one justification for creating a new advisory body or committee is that is the bandwidth that's available to, to existing uh, committees. Um, would you see an, al an alternative, uh, perhaps adding a member or two to the Habitat Committee to increase the bandwidth there to address this in lieu of creating a new advisory body? Thanks for that question, Mr. Grunlick. Uh, let, let me start with the answer and then I'll, I'll defer to Corey. She can wrap it up and probably bring it home better than I can. Um, I think that the Habitat Committee's focus primarily is on habitat. And I think at least uh, what we're thinking is that this is beyond habitat. This goes into each of the council fisheries that will be impacted. And as I noted earlier, each of the council's fisheries will be impacted. It'll also have impacts on dependent ports and communities. So I think while the Habitat Committee's role and in inputs into our group would be instructive, informative, and indispensable, I, I don't think that, that, that their scope is broad enough to cover all that I think that will be needed to be covered in dealing with offshore developments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Mike just said it perfectly. All right, great. Uh, I don't see any further questions. Thanks very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Lane Johnson of Rhoda. Welcome. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to provide public comment. My name is Lane Johnston, and I'm the Programs Manager for the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance. Uh, Rota supports the Council in developing strategies to address offshore development as early as possible. So first, for those who 
don't know, Rhoda is a membership-based coalition of fishery-dependent companies and associations committed to improving the compatibility of new offshore development with their businesses. Our approximately 170 members are comprised of major fishing community groups, individual vessel owners, and shoreside dealers operating in federal and state waters of the New England, Mid-Atlantic, and Pacific coasts. We have members in Washington, Oregon, and California operating in most of the federally permitted West Coast fisheries. So Rhoda highly encourages the council to consider how they plan to address the imminent offshore development projects coming to the region. The only way to be successful in understanding potential impacts from development to other ocean users is to be proactive and start building capacity and knowledge now. Based on our experience from Southern New England and Mid-Atlantic, Offshore wind development, renewable energy goals set by states, statements from the incoming administration, and the recent commercial aquaculture EO, development offshore is coming fast. So we highly support the council consider and plan for how they will interact and inform development projects that are within their jurisdiction. We've seen a huge demand that offshore development has put on everyone from NIP Science Center staff to council members and staff fishing industry representatives, and other ocean users. We believe putting a structure in place early helps the councils address concerns, reply to requests for information, submit comment letters, participate in forums that solicit input and other possible demands. Currently, the new, in the New England and Mid-Atlantic Fishery Management Councils, offshore wind and aquaculture policies are worked through the Habitat Committee and the Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee, respectively. Each council has taken a different approach, but having a dedicated group where the development considerations are funneled through helps prevent anything from falling through the cracks. Uh, the PFMC should put in place whatever structure works best for the re region and associated communities. Uh, I would also like to thank Southwest and Northwest Science Center staff, as well as several council members who have already began discussions with Rhoda. And for many of you who were able to attend and contribute to building our information base through the synthesis of the science workshop held, held last month, we're beginning to plan a summit focused on development considerations specific to the West Coast for early next year. And we will share de details once they're ironed out and warmly invite everyone at the council to attend the summit. Um, thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lane. Oh, I see one hand, Louis Zim. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for your uh, testimony, Lane. And um, I admit to, to have not been following the situation back on uh, the East Coast. And so um, I have to ask you a couple questions because I'm really far behind on this. Uh, so what, what issues have been brought up to... Uh, to your East Coast bodies, I think specifically uh, the Mid-Atlantic, uh, by this committee so far? Um, I'm personally more familiar with the New England one, but I can speak a little bit to the Mid-Atlantic one. I think um, there's just a huge demand on the council staff um, for each of those committees to really you know, provide input answer comment letters it's not just to BOEM or the states but NIMPS, Coast Guard like all these agencies that it's there's a lot of balls in the air and I just as long as um they each each council has a kind of a plan and a strategy in place that works for that council so I I just would highly recommend whatever the answer is putting it in place early as early as possible I hope that started to answer your question well, through the chair, uh, thank you very much, Lane. Um, uh, what uh, for this co committee, say for New England committee, um, what members, what part of the public have been brought into this, and how big has this committee been? How many, how many members have there been on the committee? Uh, sorry. Uh, so, thank you for that question. The Offshore development work has gone through the Habitat Committee, which was an existing committee already. And then same for the Mid-Atlantic, the Ecosystems and Ocean Planning Committee was an existing committee. And most of the work goes through those 
um, those two committees. Um, I'm off the top of my head. I'm not sure how big those are, um, but I can find out and, and get back to you. Oh, thank you through the chair. Uh, that that's very helpful. So uh, what it, what it appears to me is that uh, you already have an ocean planning committee, and uh, that is staffed by the actual uh, people on the in the in the council family, and it's not uh, out lar writ large out into the community. It's uh, it's more a council movement. Thank you. Uh, any further questions? Thank you very much, Lane. Uh, Steve Scheiblauer, welcome. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Steve Scheiblauer, uh, and good morning, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, I am speaking in support of the proposal submitted by PCFFA and Ocean Conservancy to create this, this new subcommittee. And it's one that would both uh, be informed and also task to inform the council about offshore developments. And these you know, developments will just clearly affect council managed fisheries, fishing communities, and the greater ecosystem. I believe that these developments will cross over to numerous council advisory bodies and other areas of expertise so I do not believe that a single existing advisory body can be inclusive enough. And as you know, I'm on the Habitat Committee, and we have recommended the creation of such a, such a new committee uh, for that reason. Uh, the crossover is significant. Uh, ecosystem matters, uh, big socioeconomic considerations and information, uh, even affecting uh, trawl surveys. And then also you have the, uh, the opportunity to create a peer report a peer to peer relationship with other fishery management councils to share information and so forth. Uh, these are things that the exi an existing advisory body uh, really would not be able to do in my opinion. Um, I'll also point out, I, I work closely with, with several central coast fishing communities. And in the last four years, uh, the central coast has seen first an offshore wind proposal at, at about hundred square miles. And then this summer, uh, the offshore industry, uh, wind industry, came in with a proposal uh, for 730 square miles. And then also uh, this summer, uh, a group of major uh, environmental organizations wrote uh, to, to the state of California, uh, basically um, demanding uh, about 1,300 square miles be set aside for offshore wind alone. And so, you know, the urgency of this and the, and the momentum behind doing these projects uh, is significant, and we are quite worried that they're going to be done without su sufficient information. And, and so I do ultimately here, my, to conclude, urge that you support this proposal before you to create this new body that would, again, collect information, get it out to the public, interested parties, and provide information to Baum and others who, who need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. I do have a question for you, Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Steve, that's a great testimony. I'm very informative. I really, uh, coming from you from the, being on the Habitat Committee that answered a lot of questions in my mind. Um, I, the question I had is, I know you've been following this uh, ocean-based climate solutions plan and the potential for action in the next Congress and potentially even an executive order that would further remove um, the council process and Magnuson from the wind, particularly wind energy uh, uh, comments and, and input and participation at all. I um, do you see this as a, even a greater need to have this committee to be proactive to find out uh, what is going on that we're not involved with as a council, as 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 a as as a you know um, stewards of the West Coast fishing industry? So I, I think that I, I would you know look to your comments on that if you think this is actually even 
uh, upping the ante to have this committee? Mr. Chair, Mr. Dooley, thank you for the question. Um, the answer, short answer is yes, I do think there's a need. And as has been pointed out uh, to Boehm numerous times, uh, the Outer Continental Shelf uh, Land Management Act is not the only significant federal law that you know, basically allocates uh, ocean resources. You have the Magnuson-Stevens Act as well. And so I really think that that's the playing field that needs to be leveled, is to make sure that Magnuson-Stevens and what the council does in implementing that uh, you know, has a real strong voice and presence not, and is not dominated by the Offshore Lands Act. Hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Steve. Any further questions of Steve? Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, Jeff Chester, followed by Gilly Lyons. Uh, hi, good morning, uh, members of the council, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to comment. Um, this is Jeff Chester uh, speaking on behalf of the conservation group Oceana. Um, first, we wanted to uh, support uh, Anna Weinstein as the, the conservation representative uh, for the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel. Uh, I've known Anna uh, personally and worked with her closely for over 10 years now. Um, we worked together on the California uh, Herring Fishery Management Plan Steering Committee, where uh, she played a key role in raising uh, money to, to make the FMP go forward. She built bridges with the industry. Uh, and she brought in uh, key uh, scientific players as well uh, to find uh, common ground solutions and played a key role in, in reaching those. Um, she is a, a leader and an integral member of a coalition of conservation groups that engage regularly in coastal pelagic species issues. Uh, we, we tend to have uh, these, these you know, preparatory calls before each council meeting uh, to kind of share where all the conservation groups are on various issues related to CPS. And Anna has continued to be a leader and, and a key member of that coalition. Uh, she'll also be able to bring in uh, new members of the scientific community, uh, specifically in the kind of ecosystem science uh, area, as well as the communities of uh, birding and, and ecotourism more generally, and, and those values uh, from those stakeholder communities uh, and those perspectives that they bring as well. Um, we believe uh, that the conservation community currently does not have uh, adequate representation on uh, either the, the council or its advisory bodies at the moment. Um, and certainly Ms. Weinstein's appointment would be a step forward and urge you to, um, to appoint her to the committee uh, today. Um, secondly, we, uh, we do also support the formation of uh, a new committee on offshore developments, um, uh, particularly the proposal that uh, Mr. Conroy and Ms. Ridings uh, provided and brought forward. I wanted to commend their efforts and their leadership on that front. Uh, we see offshore development as, as currently posing unprecedented and, and major threats to both fisheries and ecosystems. Uh, it's not just habitats, but it's also endangered species, uh, the, the pelagic ecosystems, migratory species, uh, and many others. And uh, I think in listening to the gap statement uh, and, the, and the subsequent questions, the, 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 they certainly rep recognized uh, the concern and the threat as well. Um, and while they said they weren't sure about a committee, I, I didn't really hear any, any sort of alternative, uh, better uh, suggestion um, from them. So I really do believe that you know, what we've heard is that ecosystem the existing committees, the ecosystem committee and the habitat committee, currently, you know, while they do engage, they're not, the, the, their engagement due to the resources and other things on their plate is, is really not, not adequate given the, the current threat and the priority. And, um, and, and honestly, we think that many projects, particularly fin fish net pens uh, uh, and wind farms in, in, in most places may not be compatible with fisheries and ecosystems. And the council uh, really needs to amplify its role and play a key role in that determination, providing the information uh, and the stakeholder involvement to, to come up with those determinations. Uh, as far as the specifics, as far as the, how the committee operates, it sounded like in the proposal there would be time to consider that and think through that over the spring. Um, we do think this is a, an important allocation of, of council staff and resources, recognizing it will take that uh, additional staff and resource time. We think it is uh, important enough to do that. 
It would allow ultimately the council to more effectively engage in these offshore shore development projects. And, and ultimately, uh, I think as you've already seen, help find areas of, of common ground among uh, the council stakeholder community, as, as you can already see uh, in these comments uh, in support from, from various aspects and from various perspectives. So thank you uh, again for your, your time and effort and, um, uh, and, and we appreciate being a part of the council process. Thanks very much, Jeff. Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, once again. Um, I, I just wanted to thank Jeff for uh, his comments and especially for uh, the effort that the conservation uh, community put forth to uh, join together to, to bring up an excellent uh, person uh, to staff uh, this position. Uh, I, I really like the way that everybody got together and uh, came up with a, a very good answer. Thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. Thanks very much, Jeff. And Gilly Lyons, please come forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the council. My name is Gilly Lyons with the Pew Charitable Trusts. Thanks very much for the opportunity to provide some brief comments uh, today on your consideration of membership appointments. I will be providing these comments today on behalf of Pew, Ocean Conservancy, Wild Oceans, and National Audubon. We just wanted to uh, take this opportunity to voice our enthusiastic support for Anna Weinstein's appointment to the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel as the conservation representative. We believe that Anna would be an excellent addition to the CPSAS and would bring with her a blend of skills and knowledge that we know will be of great value to both the advisory subpanel and to the council. Anna's experience with CPS issues, her technical understanding of Pacific Ocean food webs, her strong conservation ethic, and the thoughtful, open-minded, and collaborative way that she approaches all of her work combine to make her a great candidate for this seat. We strongly encourage the council to appoint Anna to the CPSAS as its next conservation representative. Thanks very much for your consideration this morning. I appreciate it. Thanks, Gilly. And let me say that um, uh, whomever the council appoints to take your place on that advisory subpanel will have some very big shoes to fill. We've really appreciated your contributions. Um, Any questions of Gilly? Thanks very much, Gilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, that concludes public comment and brings us to council action. We've got a number of different um, items to address and some by motion, some not. Um, let me just first see if there is any preliminary discussion around the table. Looking for a hand. Louis Zim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to say how much I appreciate uh, all the input on uh, this offshore development committee. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that uh, this would take a lot of effort and energy upon, uh, upon the part of the council staff and uh, the council members. Uh, you, you already see the upwelling of support uh, from, from the public on this. Uh, so I um, would like to see uh, a way forward that we could do something affirmative on this, and I'm uh, looking forward to comments of the other council members. All right, thank you, Louie. Uh, Virgil Moore. Can you hear me okay this morning? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the issue of the uh, committee structure, I guess part of it is my own ignorance of process and budget, but I'm 
I, I guess my concerns revolve around capacity. What capacity does the council have with current budget and staffing and membership time to support additional activities that are important to our mission? Uh, I'm not trying to pass judgment on this particular committee as much as I'm asking questions about um, how do we support continued needs that are out there uh, relative to the council's responsibilities for conservation and management of our ocean resources for both um, recreational and commercial purposes. So I'll, I'll leave it there and, and then pipe in uh, at some point, but I certainly would like to hear from our executive director at some point uh, relative to those aspects as this discussion moves forward. Thank you. Thanks, Virgil. That's a fair question. And since you had a specific question that Chuck could address, I'll call on Chuck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Virgil, for the question. Uh, you know that that is uh, that is an issue that I think uh, is worth exploring here. I, I think there are some uh, you know some issues that uh, that are. Um, would be challenging for the for the council and council staff. Um, I, I did uh, ask Patricia to come up with a quick estimate of what it would cost to have a committee uh, similar to what was being suggested. So um, I, I do see a lot of similarities in in, uh, in uh, sort of the construct of the committee with the habitat committee. <clears throat> so I asked her to look at something like that with perhaps. Uh, or four more uh, industry type representatives. Right now, we have a dad as one commercial, one recreational fishery representative on it. So I thought, um, you know, I saw looking at that, uh, you know, assuming they would meet uh, at each council meeting, uh, that would be about $65,000 a year to, uh, to have them uh, meet and travel. Uh, if there were outside meetings, uh, there would be some more. Um, so that, just from a monetary perspective, that's a that's a quick and dirty estimate there. I would I would note that uh, uh, I, I and I'll let the agencies speak to this, but uh, we certainly um, struggle already getting uh, all of our uh, membership appointments done. Uh, there's a number of vacancies uh, that uh, that just uh, seem difficult to fill uh, or to keep, uh, you know, keep consistently um, filled. Um, for example, uh, there was some talk about the, you know, the economics of the issues that would be uh, investigated by this by this committee potentially. Uh, we, you know, we struggle to have to keep uh, economists on the GMT. We don't have any right now. Um, the uh, salmon team doesn't have an economist either. Um, I uh, I suspect uh, from the from some of the state agencies it would be difficult to have you know two different people one habitat and one this other committee. Uh, so I suspect there'd uh, there'd either be overlap, which would uh, you know would just result in additional workload um, to to the state agency. So. But uh, but I'll let them I'll let them speak to that uh, themselves. Council staffing, yes, there would be you know some additional uh, work uh, for not just the staff officer, but of course the administrative staff. Um, so you know I think I think there is a I think there is a uh, significant cost I guess in terms of both um, monetary and and uh, staffing for the for the staff and potentially. Um, for the agencies that would be asked to, to fill the agency seats uh, on the committee. Um, maybe while I've got the floor here, I, I guess I will mention that, you know, I heard some questions about uh, whether the, <coughs> whether BOEM knows the council exists or not. And uh, yes, they do. And I guess I, I, I know I've pointed out a, a couple of times in my last couple of months that we have started a new engagement process with BOEM where we meet with them 
with their leadership group every before every council meeting to see if there's any uh, news that needs to come before the council to uh, you know notify them of uh, upcoming uh, projects and deadlines. As, as a result of that, we ended up with the wind energy letter to, to the California Wind Energy Group uh, in September. Um, and then we've also, uh, we plan to have them come on an annual basis to our marine planning agenda item in, um, in March um, to uh, give a more uh, broad um, presentation to the council on activities that BOEM is having. So, so we've, we've already kind of upped our game to a certain extent uh, in, in that regards. So uh, anyway, that, that, uh, those are my comments on Mr. Moore's question and a couple other things. All right, thanks, Chuck. Uh, Brad Pettinger and followed by Maggie Summer. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gerelnik. Um It's a really good testimony uh, today on this this matter, um, it seems to me that um, there's obviously a lot of things being looked at in the ocean, and I'm worried about a basically a tsunami of of development happening. And how what's the best way for us to be equipped to do that? I'm not sure that a committee is yet, um, but I think that um, uh, between now and looks like as Chuck mentioned, we have a marine planning update in March. Um, I think it's time to maybe think about how that might work. Um, I'd like to dig in a little more as far as the other councils, how they how how they're doing it, and how it's working. Um, but uh, I just would just say I really appreciate the testimony we heard today, because this is a uh, a big issue, and it looks like it's going to be a, a lot bigger in the future. Uh, we need to be prepared for that. Thank you. Thank you, Brad, Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, I agree with the remarks, um, certainly an, an issue that is important to the council as a whole, um, clearly a, a cross SMP issue and more uh, as, as development could and, and is likely to affect all fisheries, habitats, ecosystems, et cetera. You know, I'm thinking about this and, and uh, really considering these issues of capacity and, and what a good way to approach this is. It, it, stands out that we have the expertise in place with, within existing advisory bodies. Um, it has just been brought up that it's, it's a capacity issue. Um, but given some of the, the points that Chuck reminded us of with difficulty we, we have in um, keeping our advisory bodies and, and management teams fully um, yeah, uh, fully occupied with with members. Um, I, I don't mean occupied with issues. Sorry, keeping uh, uh, you know seats filled on those, and thinking about some of uh, you know back to the budget report. Uh, the council may have some resources at least in the near term. It it feels to me like what we really might be looking for at this point is those focused eyes and ears. Um, is a, a point person to maybe make sure that uh, each of our advisory bodies and teams, as appropriate, is aware of these issues uh, as they come up and, and have a, a coordinated um, approach and schedule to providing input to the council on those. Um, it's uh, good to hear from Chuck that there is a, a meeting with the BOEM leadership group before every council meeting. And I wonder if there is capacity within either current council staff or potentially a, a new staff member position of, of some sort to uh, really be the point on these offshore development issues and be the connection, be the liaison to each of our advisory bodies and management teams on those issues. Just thought I'd put that out there for question and discussion, um, not expecting that the council would reach resolution necessarily on this today. Thank you, Maggie. <clears throat> uh, the Chuck, um, well, let me call on Michael Clark and then I got a question for Chuck. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to offer my support for establishing this new advisory body focused on 
offshore development issues. I found the endorsement of the existing ecosystem and habitat committees particularly compelling and may foster a even more proactive uh, approach and lend the necessary focus and bandwidth to stay on top of these activities that, as others have mentioned, will likely have a significant impact on uh, many, if not all, of the council managed fisheries. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So, Chuck, uh, Maggie offered a, a suggestion, um, or perhaps a, a path forward, and that is to designate an existing council staff member to sort of be a point person to collect this information or, or news as it comes up and making sure the existing advisory bodies are aware. Is, is that something that we could we could do at least in the short run here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, we, you know, uh, Carrie, Carrie Griffin is our uh, marine planning uh, point person, I guess. Um, so in, in terms of, you know, identifying a body, I, you know, uh, so, so Carrie does uh, track marine planning issues and, um, you know, staffs the marine planning uh, update in March, uh, which has been a regular feature for a number of years in the council. Um, uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, that there's outreach to the other um, to the other advisory bodies for, you know, say for giving briefings on um, particular issues uh, as, as they arise, uh, you know, I think that that responsibility would would fall to him. Um, so, uh, so I, I think we I think we're uh, pretty well positioned to do that. Um, you know, I, I guess it's just a question of um, you know, volume, I guess, or, or you know, um, how how much that's happened in the past. Um, I I think there's I think it would also be helpful, um, perhaps, uh, to have um, each advisory body have a sort of a contact person, and you know, maybe that could just be the the chair, or uh, but uh, I, I know in the past. For example, uh, we there used to be a salmon advisory sub panel uh, habitat liaison, and that person would attend all the habitat committee reports and then report back to the um, to the salmon advisory panel on issues of uh, relevance. But uh, I'm not suggesting that you know that that uh, that that model be used for all the advisory bodies. But but I think I think having some sort of um, yeah. Uh, dedicated uh, or, you know, known uh, uh, pathway for information flow uh, to and from uh, either the Habitat Committee or, or this new proposed committee or something for each of the uh, advisory bodies would, would be uh, something worth looking at as well. Louis. Well, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair. Um, I may have heard wrong. Uh, this is addressed to Chuck. Um, I believe Maggie rose the question of whether there be funds or the ability to have a new staff member doing this kind of work. Uh, thank you, Mr. Zem, for the, for the question. Uh, well, that that I think would be a uh, that's a that's a whole nother uh, uh, order of magnitude sort of answer for that one, and uh, you know that I think we would really have to look, um, uh, you know, at the council staff as a whole, and the and uh, I think we'd need to look at the uh, the work, you know, the council uh, staff workload across all uh, FMPs and and areas uh, in order to determine that. I, um, you know, we've, we've, uh, added, uh, some capacity to council staff recently through contracting, additional contracting. That's kind of, uh, how, how we've, uh, addressed some of those needs at this point. So, you know, um, adding a, somebody for this would probably be more like adding a, a permanent 
staff member, and uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not willing to uh, commit to anything like that uh, at this point. Uh, I would certainly take a lot of uh, budget analysis to, to figure that out if, if we would be able to sustain that uh, in the long term, because those, those are not the sort of things you want to uh, start and stop, obviously. All right, thanks, Chuck. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Oh, well, you know, I um, I think there's a consensus around the table as well as within the fishing industry of just how important this issue is uh, and the uh, uh, potential threat that uh, expansion of these different types of activities within our oceans that take up geographic space uh, are to our, to our uh, fishing industry as a whole. So I don't think there's any, any uh, disagreement about the importance of this issue uh, around the table. Uh, there are, uh, however, a number of different ideas as to how the council should engage. Um, and uh, a number of you know good ideas, um, uh, but I, I I don't think we're ready to make a decision on um, the uh, the formulation of a committee just yet. Um, I'm looking at our March agenda and seeing that we have some uh, ecosystem uh, agenda items uh, scheduled. Um, our ecosystem work group is uh, also, uh, I believe, meeting um, during that, as part of that um, March meeting. Uh, and, uh, you know, so I, I, I think that uh, um, it, will, it would also be important for us to get some, some thoughts from the other advisory panels that <clears throat> may wish to weigh in, not the least of which is the Habitat Committee. <clears throat> Uh, if that's a direction we're contemplating. I also think it's, um, I was aware of the, the meetings that, that you have instigated, uh, Chuck, with, um, with uh, BOEM in advance of our council meetings and, and uh, appreciate you taking, taking the initiative to do that. Um, and I think, the, you know, the idea of whether or not there's additional Council staff resources uh, to be brought to bear is a topic that we could ask uh, Chuck and, and the staff to think further about. Uh, I'd also like to get the input from the ecosystem work group on, on you know, they're obviously thinking about aquaculture activities. And so um, I think we would value uh, from uh, their insights on this. So again, I'm not trying to throw cold water on the idea of developing a, uh, a committee, uh, but I do think it's premature to make that decision uh, today. Uh, and I would suggest that we agendize this topic at our March meeting, uh, giving our other advisory panels the opportunity to weigh in, as well as giving our, um, our executive director and council staff an opportunity to think about a little bit more, as well as, the, as our state um, our state folks who are engaged in uh, several different forums outside the council process that deal with this issue. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Anderson, thanks very much. Um, let me ask uh, if, if there's anyone who disagrees with the approach that, that uh, Phil has put out. A person I think is very sensible. Bob Dooley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to weigh in that, uh, yes, I, I agree with the, the Phil's points. I do. I think it is, it, but I don't, uh, I don't disagree or I don't agree that um, it isn't a huge problem. I mean, I think we, you know, it. my perception on this is that there's a, uh, a potential for a level of disengagement from our process and not having ability to weigh in the normal channels that's going on in the uh, particularly with the bill that we've heard so much about 
uh, in the potential executive order and all the concern about that. And the, and that would remove it from the normal channels that we would typically deal with in Magnuson cons- uh, in the council process. And particularly if it ends up in an executive order and having a committee that could uh, be proactive and, and, you know, and informative on, on these issues from that don't come through the normal uh, process or will not follow the normal process. And Bohm appears over the time to be one of those that, you know, we've made some inroads, but still far from being able to, to turn the dials in the er- early in the process. So to that end, I, I, I think we should definitely prioritize this and, and put it on the agenda to talk about. But I do understand all of Phil's concerns and everyone else's concerns that maybe it's a little, little rushed. But I, you know, I also worry that, and we talked about it on that executive order uh, possibility, that we won't have an opportunity before March to weigh in. And we've taken some steps to de- do that. But the information and getting the information into the, into our system is important, and I see this uh, a, a committee like this could possibly serve that uh, purpose that of being proactive rather than reactive. So that's 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 all I'll say. And I but I do agree with, exactly with Phil's comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Bob. Phil. Well, just to to clarify if that's needed um, in response to Bob's remarks. I think this is a huge issue and it is a problem for for us to be facing into the future for for council managed fisheries and state managed fisheries like the crab fishery and pink shrimp fishery to, to name a couple. So if, if there was something within my comments that suggested I didn't think this was a big problem, I just wanted to clarify that I do think it is a big problem. Yeah, thanks, Phil. I think you're you were you were clear on that. All right. Well, not seeing any other hands raised, uh, it looks like that uh, it's the sense of the council to come back to this uh, in March. I saw Louis's hand go up for a second and back down. Um, so we have a number of other items to take up under this agenda item. And what I would like to do is go to, um, our appointments, um, unless there is an objection to, to going down that road. Um, I'd like, I'd like to start first to see if there's any discussion or motion um for the opening on the coastal pelagic species advisory subpanel phil anderson and thank you mr chairman um and i i do have a motion i do um want to say that and acknowledge that we had two very well qualified uh, individuals that were nominated for this position. And while we can only uh, place one person in this position, uh, that is not in any way to um, suggest that the, both individuals aren't highly qualified. And I'm hoping that both individuals will continue to be active in the, in the council process. Uh, so with that as a preface, um, I believe Sandra has um, my motion ready to put in front of the group. And it is that I move to, I move the council appoint Ms. Anna Weinstein to the conservation position on the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory subpanel, formerly held by Ms. Gilly Lyons. Okay, uh, I feel that language uh, is complete and accurate on the screen. Yes, it is. I'm looking for a second, uh, Bush Smith. Uh, please speak to your motion if necessary. Well, I'm pleased to put uh, Anna's Anna's name forward. She she's uh, been a big part of the council process um, for the last uh, six to ten years. Uh, appreciate her contribution, and I'm pleased to put her name forward for consideration. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks very much. 
Any uh, council discussion on this motion? Not seeing any, I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Uh, abstentions? A motion passes unanimously. Uh, welcome, Anna Weinstein, to the CPSAS, and, and Gilly, as, as I've said before, uh, we're going to miss you. We hope you stay involved in the council process. Okay, so we have uh, other appointments to make. Uh, we have some uh, positions open. Uh, there's some uh, NIMS appointments to the groundfish management team as well as to the groundfish endangered species work group. So do we have any council discussion or motions on that? Mr. Ryan Wolf. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I have a motion for all of those positions. Uh, please go ahead. I move the council appoint Ms. Gretchen Hanshu and Mr. Daniel Stute to the two West Coast region positions on the ground fish management team formerly held by Ms. Abigail Harley and Ms. Karen Palmagino. Dr. Chantel Wetzel to the vacant Northwest Fisheries Science Center position on the ground fish management team and Mr. Scott Benson to the sea turtle taxa position on the ground fish endangered species work group formerly held by Dr. Tomo Iguchi. All right, and is language on the screen accurate and complete? Yes, it is. And do I have a second to this motion? Seconded by Maggie Summer. Please speak to your motion as necessary. Thank you. Um, I'll take him in order here. Ms. Ms. Hanshu has been working on groundfish fisheries management issues in the region since 2005. She served as the NIMS lead on the development of many major groundfish actions, including most recently, as I'm sure most of you remember, Amendment 28, the Pacific Coast Groundfish Fishery Management Plan. Uh, she's also served on the GMT previously for a number of years and has also uh, spent some time as our acting groundfish branch chief in 2017, so she brings a wealth of experience. Uh, Mr. Sud is our West Coast Region Recreational Fisheries Coordinator, who's responsible for implementing our West Coast Recreational Fisheries Engagement Plan in support of the National Rec Policy. Uh, but he's worked on a number of other issues uh, related to fisheries management in the region. He has experience analyzing data, drafting NEPA documents, completing rulemakings, uh, and I think both Mr. Suit and Ms. Sanchu will be able to effectively contribute to the GMT and its work. And but before I continue on, I, I would like to take a moment here on behalf of the region to thank Ms. Harley and Ms. Palmagino for their years of outstanding service on the GMT and for their contributions and insight on ground fish fisheries. They have both done an, an outstanding job in, in, in representing the agency and supporting uh, the immense work of the GMT. They do leave big shoes to fill, but we look forward to continuing our commitment to staffing this team, especially in regards to its importance in the council process. Regarding Dr. Wetzel, since 2009, she has contributed directly to 11 ground fish assessments, recently leading the assessments for Pacific Ocean Perch in 2017, as well as the 2019 Petrale Sole update. She, uh, she possesses an expert knowledge level of the stock synthesis modeling framework that is commonly used for our assessments and would provide the GMT with great expertise in the area of fisheries data and analysis, uh, as well as interpreting stock assessment results for management. Regarding Mr. Scott Benson, he has performed research on the ecology of leatherback turtles, primarily at U.S. Uh, West Coast foraging grounds, but also at Western Pacific nesting beaches. And this has included design and implementation of research projects, extensive field work, conducting aerial surveys and satellite telemetry studies, nesting beach monitoring, and, and quantitative analyses of data and synthesis to meet management objectives. And for all those reasons, we feel he'd be a valuable addition to the sea turtle taxa position on the ground fish endangered species work group. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Is there any discussion on this motion? Not seeing any hands, I'll call the question. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. <coughs> Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Welcome to all of these new members to the council family. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, has some vacancies, one on the groundfish management team and one on the groundfish endangered species work group. So, um, Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to council appoint Ms. Catherine Pearson to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the groundfish management team, formerly held by Mr. Patrick Myrick, and Ms. Lynn Mattis to the vacant Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife position on the groundfish endangered species work group. Okay, and the language on the screen is accurate and complete? Yes. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Brad Pettinger, please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, we are very pleased to um, be just bringing Katie Pearson on to ODFW's Marine Resources Program and our commercial groundfish project leader position. Um, she brings a, uh, a, a very strong background in natural resource management and science issues, including uh, both marine and fishery related work uh, some years ago with our marine program and uh, other inland um, uh, you know, related topics. She has a strong um, skill set in both uh, data analysis and writing and presentation. And uh, she know that she was able to remind folks of, of her nomination to this position that it might mean she was leaving the GMT. And that is certainly not the case. She will continue to serve on the GMT. Uh, and she will also bring her knowledge of groundfish fisheries to the endangered species work group. Thanks. Thank you, Maggie. Any discussion on the motion? Not hearing any, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thanks very much, Maggie, for the motion. Um, I think that completes all of the appointments that need to be done by motion. Um, we do have the vacancies on the gem TAC and the gem PAC, um, to which Mr. Torres and Mr. Orchard have been mentioned. Um, and it is my intent to accept those recommendations, um, but obviously I want to consult with the council. So I want to see if there's any objections or alternatives to those appointments. And not seeing any hands, um, we'll make that so. And I th think we may have, Mike alluded to one other issue, uh, Maggie Summer. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I wanted to alert the council um, that while I am the council's alternate representative, to the International Pacific Halibut Commission, Mr. Anderson, of course, being the primary representative. Um, I have a conflict and will not be available to participate in the IPHC's annual meeting in January. So I wanted to uh, offer that in case the council wishes to identify um, somebody else to fill that alternate role to ensure uh, continuing council representation at the IPHC meeting. Uh, Phil Anderson. Oh, I didn't want to jump in front of you there. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. No, go ahead. I think that uh, you have a suggestion for a, okay. a further alternate. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And um, thanks, Maggie, for bringing it forward. Uh, and at the present time, I don't. 
I, I anticipate that I will be uh, at the annual meeting of the Halibut Commission. Um, so you should expect me to fulfill that assignment. However, you never know what, hap what may happen. And I, I think it's good to have an alternate uh, designated. Uh, and so um, I would uh, recommend to you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, Heather Hall be um, the uh, alternate uh, for this year's um, Civic Council's representation at the IPHC meeting that will be held uh, toward the end of January. Okay. All right, uh, Phil, can I ask you if you've checked with Heather Hall and she's willing to serve in that role? Uh, yes, I have, and I believe she is, and I see Mr. Niles has his hand up. Oh. Uh, Mr. Niles' hand is yes, down. Yes, I did consult with Heather, and okay. she is. I just wanted to confirm for the record. So uh, unless there are, are any objections to that, um, it, seem, it seems to be an appropriate uh, assignment. Uh, not that uh, we expect to need an alternate for the meeting, but as Phil points out, it's always helpful uh, to have one. Um, and so not seeing any hands, so we'll make that so. Um, Mr. Berner, what am I missing here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't believe you're missing anything. It was a very uh, thorough treatment of the business at hand here, and, and I believe you've checked everything uh, on my list. I'm happy to go through uh, as a recap, if you like, but I, I believe that's uh, all the business we need to do here under C7. Uh, before we do a recap, let me just give, see if there's anyone, anywhere on the council has a question or a comment. And not seeing any hands, why don't you... Uh, Wrap it up for us here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So regarding uh, standing committees, the council will move, a, council staff will move ahead with uh, Ms. Svensson's uh, presidential appointment to the Western Central and Pacific Fish Commission. We'll get that letter going over the winter. Uh, as we just heard, Ms. Heather Hall is going to serve as an alternate, an additional alternate to the International Pacific Halibut Commission. Uh, should something happen and Mr. Anderson is unable to attend, appreciate her uh, backing up there. Uh, regarding advisory bodies, uh, welcome Ms. Anna Weinstein to the CPS advisory subpanel and recognize, I'd like to echo comments uh, in, uh, regarding Gilly's uh, service there, it was top notch. Uh, regarding ground fish groups, uh, with motions to approve new National Marine Fishery Service and ODFW representation to the GMD, again, echoing uh, uh, favorable comments and appreciation to the work done by outgoing members and welcoming the new folks there. Regarding the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group, two new appointments there for the ODFW position and the Sea Turtle Taxa position. Uh, Chair Gorelnik has approved the two uh, changes in membership for the Office of Law Enforcement and the Archipelago Group relative to the GEM TAC and the GEM PAC. And uh, there are a few assignments to the council staff, as I understand it, to look into our council operating procedures regarding EFPs and methodology reviews and to also consider the input here at this meeting regarding the possibility of forming a new advisory committee uh, focused on offshore development and council staff will take those assignments uh, to heart and work on those over the winter and come back uh, next year with some updates on on how things are going there with the expectation of discussing the offshore development business uh, at your march meeting where you've got marine planning on your agenda so uh, that's that's my summary, Mr. Chair. I hope we didn't miss anything. Thank you for working us through that. And uh, I, I believe that uh, completes our business. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Mike. So uh, we've been at this a while. Um, it's 9.39, let's take an 11 minute break um, and come back at 9.50 and uh, knock out uh, this last agenda item, hopefully uh, get done. Uh, this morning uh, before lunch. So I'll see you at 9.50.
All right, it's 9.50. We're going to get started here in a moment. All right, we've come to the last agenda item for the meeting. Future Council, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. And I'll turn to Chuck Tracy. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so here we are at our last day, last agenda item. Uh, so this agenda item is intended to refine general planning for future council meetings, especially in regard to finalizing the proposed agendas for the March and April 2021 council meetings to be held via webinar. Um, the relevant attachments, uh, we had attachments one, two, and three, which were the year to glance uh, proposed quick reference agendas for March and April in your advance briefing book. We've since updated those with uh, uh, attachments four, five, and six. So those are um, updates that have reflected the uh, actions and discussions that have occurred over the course of the week here. So those will be the ones that I will be um, speaking to as we go through this exercise. Um, in order to facilitate the schedule and planning uh, for March and April, the, the uh, March and April quick reference agendas are presented together uh, just because there's a short period of time between the two so that uh, we can pretty much solidify both of them to the extent possible here at this meeting. Um, although while you know there could be minor changes to the April meeting um, that would be made at the end of the March meeting, um, there's, we're just trying to get as much done here as we can in advance. Um, so the council's uh, plans are presented with the expectation that the meetings will be held via webinar with format similar to the council meetings held in the fall of 2020. Uh, so therefore, no weekend meetings or shorter days. Uh, you will note that we're uh, doing sort of a Thursday-Friday opening with the uh, weekend off and then Monday through Thursday uh, for the end of the meeting. So it's a slightly different format, but, uh, but generally the same. Um, in any event, uh, we do need to adopt uh, the final management measures for 2021 salmon seasons uh, earlier in April uh, to allow for more time for NIMS to implement the regulations before the start of the fisheries. Um, and I would note that uh, the shaded items in both the quick reference and the uh, year at a glance are items that council has identified as candidates for rescheduling either forward or backward. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through the proposed agenda materials after we've uh, heard from our advisory bodies. Um, we can talk about uh, meeting agendas. Uh, we'll also take up other workload assignments for staff and advisory bodies. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, we do have uh, quite a number of um, advisory body statements to go through here. Um, I think starting with the uh, uh, SSC, but uh, I will pause here and see if there's questions before we uh, move on to that step. Oh, well, actually, let, let me, uh, before we do that, let me just uh, real quickly go through uh, attachment for the year at a glance, just to let people know what has changed over the course of the week. Um, so for uh, CPS, uh, if you look at the June uh, meeting timeframe there, we've uh, scratched out the methodology review final. We did not have methodologies adopted for public review at this meeting, so therefore that uh, has been scratched. Uh, for ground fish, the Whiting Treaty implementation in March has been moved to April uh, because the Whiting, uh, Joint Whiting Committee is not going to meet until between the two meetings, so it doesn't make sense to have that in March. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, made some alterations to the Sablefish gear switching agenda items uh, with April being slated to identify the uh, maximum fixed gear attainment um, level uh, with the range of alternatives then identified for June. And then um, 
uh, no further um, action on that uh, is identified at this time. Uh, so uh, presumably that will occur uh, later in the process when we've got a better handle on where we're at. For HMS um, in March, we added the deep set buoy gear permit clarification. So this is the, the issues brought up at this council meeting. So there is desire to add that, uh, add that in. And then we've also in June added the drift gill net hard cap scoping issue then to look at the uh, purpose and need statement and possible options for addressing um, some of the concerns that were identified uh, under that agenda item at this meeting. For salmon, uh, we put in placeholders really for uh, Sacramento and Klamath uh, Falls Chinook Conservation Objective Review and for uh, Sacramento Falls Chinook Age Structured Assessment Update, uh, just kind of at the direction of the council to keep that on the radar screen, put it pretty far out, expect it to continue to move further out as we go through our uh, uh, with our calendar and the workload planning exercise, uh, but uh, but we did want to um, have that identified there. So uh, if for no other reason, just to um, note that we are um, continuing to look at uh, actions and uh, ways to um, uh, address the uh, concerns identified under the killer whale uh, consultation agenda item. And under other um, other agenda items, the uh, Coast Guard Fishery Enforcement Report, we have scratched that. That will be presented as a as a um, informational report. And then the uh, marine planning update, we also added uh, uh, to that to expand that a little bit to include the aquaculture area mapping issue that uh, again was identified earlier in the week. Is that? Um, and it looks like we may be adding some more to that agenda item, but we can have a little discussion about that um, when we get to council discussion um, in regards to the um, ocean development uh, developments. So uh, now I'll pause and see if there's questions before we move on to advisory bodies. Uh, any questions? Virgil Moore. <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Chuck, and I raised this issue to Chuck privately earlier, but I, I need to know when it's appropriate to talk about the dates of the meetings. And the reason for that is the November meeting next year that butts us right up onto the Thanksgiving holidays. Uh, for those of us with grandchildren and uh, children that are off during that week, that makes it very difficult. Uh, issue and for me, I have a I have a conflict. I can already tell you that. I do understand the future planning that's necessary to secure facilities, uh, but um, most schools are out during that whole week, and it is a family time of great importance. And I would ask or would like to hear whether that's a concern anybody else has. I don't mind missing the meeting or just being there for part of it. But certainly in out years, I guess the question is, should we be traveling and planning for a meeting that butts right up against uh, the Thanksgiving holidays? Thank you. Well, thanks for that, Virgil. Let's Maybe we can take that up after we... Um get our agenda set for uh, March and April. Yeah. Um, Chuck, just, do you have something to say there? Yeah, yeah I, I will just say, as I, as I mentioned to Virgil, you know, um, those meetings are scheduled out uh, usually two to, you know, at least two years in advance, maybe three, um, in order to get secure hotel contracts. Uh, we have, um, we don't have a lot of options in that regard. And then we're, we're always kind of bookended by the uh, uh, Thanksgiving holiday on, the, on, on that end and then the um, Veterans Day holiday in the middle, uh, obviously trying not to make people travel during uh, at least scheduled federal holidays. And 
And, and there are some other religious holidays that come into play uh, as well, uh, to the extent that we that we can accommodate them. So, uh, it, it's a little bit of a delicate balancing act, and you know, I'm, I'm not. Uh, anyway, I, I would just say that that uh, we we take into as consideration as, as much of that as we as we can uh, when we're when we're um, putting out requests for proposals to, to hotels for these things. All right, well, let's move on to the um, advisory body statements. Um, we have first uh, the SSE, Galen Johnson. Hey, thank uh, you, Mr. Oh. Stand by for a second. I see Marcy's hand went up. Did you have a comment, Marcy, before we got into the advisory body? Yes, I, I did. And I apologize if this is the wrong time to ask a question about the March agenda, but I, I thought that's what you had called for just prior to Virgil's remarks. Okay, if you have a question of Chuck, go ahead. Yes, I do, thank you. Um, regarding the March agenda and the item that is uh, scheduled for um, <clears throat> the Mothership Utilization, uh, Groundfish H3. Um, the agenda item is titled as scoping. And I'm just wondering why we're calling it scoping and not um, the range of alternatives. I, I thought we spent seven hours or so at the September meeting scoping the items that we were likely to see um, as areas of, of needed action. I, I thought we had a really robust discussion about um, the issues and the question of start dates and um, other um, operational um, needs and rule changes that we might consider so I was just wondering why this item is titled scoping. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair Marcy. Um, well, I, th I think uh, I think with our in our staff discussions, I think there's a need for some uh, a little bit more scoping, I guess, in terms of ID identifying issues and uh, factors that may come into play into what issues might uh, might play into the uh uh to the amendment um so I'm, I'm we've had some discussions with national fishery service i think they, they would like to have a little more discussion about some of that stuff uh yeah I, and i think uh you know uh so um uh i don't think right now we've got anything else uh on the uh calendar for uh, for that mothership utilization scoping for selection selecting a range of alternatives but um, you know I think there's certainly uh, room to develop alternatives uh, under this scoping agenda I just not sure we're quite ready to uh, formally adopt a range of alternatives uh, at this meeting let's uh, follow up on that once we get to council discussion yeah. um, so uh, Gail and I apologize, but uh, please, please provide the SSC report. Gail Johnson. Oh, sorry. There <laughs> I was <you> muted. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Gail Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. And I'll be reading the Scientific and Statistical Committee report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The Scientific and Statistical Committee met November 12th and 13th, 2020, and discussed future meeting council meeting agenda items and workload planning. A subgroup of the SSC and Mr. John DeVore have been working on a database design for research and data needs, and the SSC finds this topic ready for review by other advisory bodies and the council in March 2021. An informational report on this project is available in the November briefing book, Informational Report 3. 
Work on predicting gear switching behavior in the sablefish fishery should be ready for review by the SSC Economics and Ground Fish Subcommittees before the March 2021 Council meetings, and the SSC re recommends this review. At the request of the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment Team, the SSC proposes a meeting of the CCIEA team and the SSC. C Ecosystem Subcommittee in January of 2021 to discuss portions of the annual ecosystem status report for which data collection and processing were impacted by COVID-19 precautions. For groundfish and coastal pelagic species, the attached table shows the proposed schedule for the 2021 stock assessment review panels, as well as SSC Groundfish Subcommittee reviews of data moderate and data limited assessments and the post-assessment review process at the end of the year. The SSC supports the Sablefish Management um, Strategy Evaluation Team's proposal to engage with council stakeholders in a workshop in spring of 2021. The SSC recommends an SSC Highly Migratory Species Subcommittee meeting before the March 2021 Council meeting to review proposed proxies for status determination criteria to inform domestic management of big eye and yellowfin tunas. Finally, Agenda Item F1, Attachment 1, states that the STT's preseason report 1 will be available in early March 2021. The SSC is currently scheduled to meet the first week of March 2021, and if these two occurrences happen as scheduled, there will be insufficient time for the SSC to review and approve the contents of preseason report 1 for the March meeting, especially if there are changes to forecast and or exploitation rate calculation methodologies due to sampling disruptions resulting from COVID-19 precautions their statement. Thank you, Galen. Are there questions? Uh, Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Galen, for the report. Um, getting to the first, I guess, recommendation you have on the research and data needs database, I did look at informational report three, and maybe just the, you could give me the SSC's perspective on what the council would be doing in March. Is it just uh, a review and then more guidance or are there some decisions that would be need need to be made at that time and sort of what what's the schedule now to get from the current status of the database to implementation somewhere down the road? Thanks. Sure, I'm actually going to defer to John DeVore if he is listening in because he's been working with that subgroup. Is John available? Yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Members, uh, thank you. Um, as you'll see in Informational Report 3, um, one of the key there's there's all kinds of questions on the structure of the database that the council could weigh into, but one of the key elements of the database um, that the council uh, should weigh in on is how they want to receive priorities for research and data need projects, whether directly through uh, the database, um, it can be constructed so that individual advisory bodies rank uh, research projects under the FMPs they're uh, associated with uh, through the database, or it could just uh, come directly uh, to uh, um, perhaps the SSC first or directly to the council in a council process. So that'll be a decision point um, that the council um, will uh, address or could address in March. And the database could be uh, structured according to uh, council preferences on that call, but certainly other structural elements of the database. Um, you know, we have we have uh, questions about and some of the details there in informational report three. So uh, we would we would pose those key questions to the council so that we can tailor the database to uh, ideally meet council's uh, needs for establishing research and data need priorities. Great, thank uh, you. Pete, Pete, that answers your question? Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, any other questions of the SSC? Thanks, Galen, and thanks, John. So we'll next hear from the HMS management team, Liz Helmers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, council members. Uh, the highly migratory species management team discussed the scheduled and tentatively scheduled HMS agenda items for the March meeting, as well as those on the year at a glance calendar. In relation to the discussion topics during this meeting, the team recommends some changes to these proposed agendas. Uh, just to highlight the main changes, the team is suggesting removing the SMMP discussion from March and moving that to November 2021. Um, also, as was noted earlier, the deep set buoy gear qualifying criteria um, outlined in the NIMS report uh, be added to March. Um, and for June, the team is recommending adding the DGN hard caps and um, just to point out maybe a little more than scoping, maybe um, officially adding it on as a ROA for that meeting and then potentially a PPA and FPA for September. Um, our report provides some rationale for these recommendations. I'm not gonna read through all of them right now, um, but they're there for you if you would like to look at those. Um, and then lastly, um, the team just wanted to repeat its request that we made at the September council meeting, um, that the council try to spread the advisory body meetings out over a longer time period um, prior to council discussion and staggering those would really be beneficial for team members um, as it would reduce overlap of advisory body meeting obligations. Um, the HMSMT has multiple members who are on multiple advisory bodies um, and it, it makes it a little difficult for everybody to participate fully in all of those teams. And I am happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Liz. Are there questions of Liz on the HMSMT report? Thank you, Liz, for your report. We'll next hear from the HMSAS, Mike Conroy. If you're asking if we can hear you, we can't. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Uh, we got you now. Yeah, sorry about that. Couldn't unmute myself. Uh, Mike Connor reading in the HMS AS report for agenda item C8. The AS recommends a council remove the following shaded items from the proposed March 2021 meeting. Number one, the biennial management measures and harvest specs final, which is scheduled for one hour and 30 minutes. And secondly, the swordfish management and monitoring plan scheduled for two hours and replacing them with a discussion of hard caps with the potential setting a range of alternatives. We also recommend scheduling time to review some of the issues surrounding deep set buoy gear authorization that were noted in the agenda item 1I.1.A, supplemental NIF report one. And that concludes our statement, thank you. Thanks, Mike. Any questions of Mike? Krista Svensson. Chair, and uh, thanks for the report. Mr. Conroy. Um, quick question, I think. In terms of the items that you're recommending for uh, removal, was there any discussion around when they should be put on the calendar, or is that a just totally take them off the list? Through the chair, th thanks for the question, Ms. Svensson. We did not discuss uh, what when to reschedule them. I think we realized that they are important items that need to be addressed at some point in time, but we pro we feel that the items that we suggest replacing them with are a, a more higher priority at this time. Thank you. All right, any further questions of the AS? Thanks very much, Mike. We'll go next to the GMT report. Karen Palmagiano. Thank you, Chair. Can you hear me okay? 
loud and clear. Okay, my name is Karen Pomagino, and I'm going to be reading agenda item C8A, the supplemental GMT report one. GMT report reviewed the draft proposed council agenda item or agendas for March 21 and April 2021 and the preliminary year to glance. The GMT notes that both the March and April 2021 council meetings are scheduled to be conducted virtually. The GMT requests that our agenda be scheduled similarly to those of September and November, with the GMT starting several days prior to the council taking up any agenda items upon which the GMT is expected to comment. This scheduling provides more time for discussion, analysis, and writing, as well as more flexibility in dealing with the complications of remote work. This additional time should also allow the GMT to better meet the new statement submission deadline of the day prior to the council taking up that agenda item. When considering workload and an and agenda planning in general, the GMT looks to NIMS to advise the council on their ability to staff ongoing and new agenda items, including the mothership utilization issue. The GMT notes that early engagement with NIMS improves efficiency in discussions, recommendations, supporting analyses, and implementation. March 2021, the council and the GMT spent significant effort developing a process for groundfish-related workload prioritization, which was adopted in March 2019. If implemented as designed in March or April of each year, the council, the public, and advisory bodies have the opportunity to consider moving groundfish issues to the council's year at a glance. Under this process, the March meeting will start the annual prioritization process. In addition to the annual prioritization process, a standalone agenda item was established to provide the public with a clear place to submit new and or emerging groundfish issues at each meeting. In order for this process to work as intended, council staff will need to identify which items are most appropriately addressed under the new workload prioritization process with existing agenda items or as emergency agenda items. Therefore, the GMT recommends retaining the ground fist related workload prioritization item agenda item on the March agenda. April 2021. The GMT notes that, as usual, there will be little time to assemble information between the March meeting's end and the advanced briefing book deadline for the April meeting, the week of March 15th. The GMT again looks to NIMS to provide information to the Council about its ability to engage in developing groundship items currently scheduled for April. Winter work session, which is tentatively scheduled for January 11th through the 15th. The GMT typically convenes a winter session to initiate work on items scheduled for the new year and other tasks the Council charges the team to investigate. In most years, this meeting has occurred at the Council office in Portland, Oregon. However, due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the GMT recommends an online webinar style meeting consistent with the current practice of all council meetings. The, meetings. the meeting has not been scheduled, but typically occurs in mid-January to early February to avoid conflicting with the IPHC meeting. Items under consideration for this meeting, you'll note all the first few have to do with specs. Uh, routine officer elections and administrative matters, star panel planning, review of the IOPEC estimations, 2021-22 harvest specs debrief, Planning for the 2023-2024 biennial process, uh, which, GM, which the GMT understands will include a new NEPA document, which will not be tiered off the 1516 EIS. As stated above, the following actions would benefit from early engagement with NIMP staff. Therefore, the GMT does not plan on spending time on these previously prioritized issues at our January work session, unless specifically directed to do so by the council. This would include the mother stipulization scoping, sable fish gear switching, the Emily Platt exempted fishing permit, the non trawl area management, and the sable fish primary fishery limited access privilege program review. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks very much. Um, are there any questions for Karen? I'm not seeing any, Karen. Thanks very much. We'll now hear from the GAP, Susan Chambers. Good morning again, Mr. Gorelnik and council members. My name is Susan Chambers and I will be reading the supplemental GAP report one. The Ground Fish Advisory Panel reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments and suggestions. For the proposed March 2021 meeting, Referencing the proposed March 2021 agenda, the GAP recommends keeping mothership utilization on the March agenda, that is, unshaded. The industry came together to propose a suite of alternatives the GAP scoped in March and April in our informational report for June 2020, and the council scoped in September 2020, agenda item D2, situation summary. The GAP recommends keeping this item moving forward since it could result in significant improvements for the fishery. 
<clears throat> for the proposed April 2021 meeting. Reference, referencing the proposed April 2021 agenda, the GAP recommends retaining the gear switching agenda item on the April schedule, unshaded. Action taken at this meeting under agenda item G1 should allow the economics team and GMT to provide some initial analysis over the winter to inform this process and keep it moving forward. Analysis of gear switching limits to further develop and refine action alternatives should be completed by April. Continue the scoping of moving the Emily Platt exempted fishing permit into regulation. It is shaded in April. The gap requests it be unshaded for April and see below for more information. <clears throat> Regarding the year at a glance and referencing the preliminary, preliminary year at a glance summary, the gap suggests unshading and clarifying the non trawl rockfish conservation area slash Emily Platt EFP scoping item. The proposed agenda does not include the non trawl RCA item, but the gap would like to see both issues move forward as a package. And I just want to note here I see that in the uh, supplemental attachments, this has been corrected. The Council has received dozens of comments on opening the non trawl RCA process for open access vessels. The new approach proposes opening the non trawl RCA north of 3427 North Latitude to non bottom contact gear, no dingle bar, no long line, to ensure minimal contact with yellow eye rockfish. Under the proposal, fixed gear fishermen would not be limited to only the long leader gear used in the Emily Platt EFP. The long leader gear would be one option to use for targeting midwater stocks. Other types of midwater gear could also be used. Furthermore, the GAP suggests continuing scoping of this item as detailed in Table 1 of the GAP's informational report for high priority ground fish items from June 2020. A more appropriate title for combining these issues may be non trawl area management. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes our report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Susan. Are there any questions on the GAP report? Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. Um, your statement here reflects what I'm guessing was a pretty uh, detailed discussion in the GAP around the numerous issues that right now are being treated under a single header of non trawl rockfish conservation area considerations. And as I recall, um, sometime in the course, I think of 2019, um, there was a recommendation from NIMS that we kind of lump all of these things together um, once it became clear that we would not consider um, Alcod conservation area adjustments um, separate or, or the idea was to combine that issue which has lots of rootings in history um, with the idea of moving Emily Platt into regulation coupled with um, the recommendation that we had from NIMS in the 21-22 uh, specifications process that we not consider wholesale adjustments to the RCAs in specs any longer that they be treated as a a standalone agenda item. So I feel like this item has morphed and you know has a number of elements that now are contained under this one single item um, that has been on our groundfish prioritization list for a while. Um, I think it made a lot of sense to combine them in that header uh, for the discussions in 2020 and um, recognizing that it might become clear as um, the specs progressed, um, as EFP has progressed, um, which of these discussions um, might proceed first. Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding the recommendation from the gap that we continue um, 
scoping of all of these items together. Um, I'm just wondering if now or um, a future discussion in March where we're taking up ground fish prioritization, if that's a better time to ref to try to repartition this item into its component parts. Um, but I, I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the GAPS recommendation here to scope this item and see all of these issues moving forward as a package in April. Uh, Ms. Urenko, Mr. Chair, yes, um, there was a lot of discussion about that in the GAP, um, and we weren't exactly um, sure, <clears throat> excuse me, but packaging them together at this point seems to make the most sense and particularly the CCA or the CalCog conservation area discussion, <clears throat> that issue is listed in table one of our informational report. So um, we encompass that in this, hoping to get all of those together. Um, we may need to refine those further and we understand that, but we the gap does hope that we can keep moving this forward to provide some relief for the open access fishermen and the non-trawl RCA issue. I hope that helps. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Susan. Yes, that helps. I, I, I think what I'm reading here is the GAP had uh, one idea on how we might um, proceed with a, a portion of the item um i guess i would just um note that we, you know we did have some california delegation discussion on this topic um yesterday and there there may be some other approaches um that make the most sense but um i think um if what you just told me is that the gap is open to thinking about what the packaging looks like, but we definitely want to move forward with this or a subgroup of this um, on the April agenda for certain. So I think that's what I'm getting from the gap statement. Um, and you can correct me if that's off base. Uh, Ms. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Uremko and Mr. Chair. No, I think you, I think that captures it. And if need be, we can comment on this again in March. And uh, as we get more information about, you know, uh, 2021 schedule and agendas, I think you're right. Thank you, that that sounds fantastic. Much appreciated. Uh, any other uh, questions of the gap on their report? Thank you, Susan. We'll next hear from the CPS management team, Josh Lindsay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Josh Lindsay of the CPS management team, and I'll be reading the supplemental CPS management team report on this agenda item. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the Pacific Future Management Council's year at a glance summary and discussed future council meeting agenda items and workload planning. The CPS MT finds the scheduling of CPS agenda items reasonable and will plan our efforts accordingly moving forward. BSMT hopes the council will be able to be able to take up the shaded agenda items as scheduled in the YAG and as scheduled a working team meeting in February 2021 to prepare for these future agenda topics. Thank you and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thanks very much, Josh. Are there any questions of Josh? Thanks very much, Josh. And last but certainly not least, for the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel at her last meeting in that role, Gilly Lyons. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and good morning, members of the Council. Um, just for the record, my name is Gilly Lyons, and I'll be reading from Supplemental CPS AS Report 1 under this agenda item. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel discussed future meeting and workload planning and appreciates the Council's consideration of the following recommendations. 
As detailed in our supplemental report under agenda item H2, the CPSAS asks that the Council specify a process for bringing forward requests to review existing methodologies, such as the Pacific Sardine stock structure and related assumptions, as the current language in Council Operating Procedure 26 does not appear to provide such a pathway. To this end, we recommend that the Council schedule an agenda item at a future meeting to discuss where such methodology review requests would be most appropriately made. One idea raised in discussion with the CPS management team was to consider including existing methodology review requests under the same agenda item where management measures and specifications are considered. For Pacific Sardine, this would be each April, and for Pacific Mackerel, it would be each June. However, we note that linking methodology review, review requests to annual specifications agenda items could make it difficult to make requests associated with stocks that do not currently have annual specifications, for example, northern anchovy, and would leave some question as to the appropriate process for making requests that are not specific to a single stock. Another option would be to change Council Operating Procedure 26 to include an explicit pathway for addressing ex existing methodology review requests. In either case, we suggest that further council discussion and consideration will be needed to provide clarity in this matter, and note that the June 2021 meeting may offer an opportunity for that discussion, particularly if the council were to use the time currently scheduled for the methodology review final agenda item. And um, I'll just quickly note as a sidebar that um, very quickly here that we see that the um, June methodology review item will likely be canceled for the reasons that Mr. Tracy mentioned earlier. And we understand that the most appropriate place for this COP discussion um, would likely indeed be under a, CO a future COP agenda item. Um, and finally, the CPSAS requests that for the purposes of advisory body meeting agenda planning, council staff continue to seek the CPSAS co-chair's input and guidance on the timing and length of agenda items. Given the virtual nature of meetings at this time, adding an extra day to the CPAS's schedule would be beneficial and may help to better ensure adequate opportunity at the meetings to fully accomplish subpanel tasks including statement drafting, while seeking to be as efficient as possible. We understand that this arrangement may not be feasible once we return to in-person meetings, but for virtual meetings, it would allow for greater flexibility. Thank you for your consideration, and I would be happy to take any questions that the council may have. Thank you very much, Gilling. Butch Smith? Yeah, I have about 17 questions. No, that, that's not, that's, that's, <laughs> that's not right. But I, I would be remiss and I'm sorry if I um, make a rookie mistake here, Mr. Chairman, but I would uh, like to recognize and, and thank Gilly for always being a top notch person um, to deal with in my former life and, and, and continue. And I wish her well, and I hope she's not um, disappearing. And, and I really hope at some point in time that we, are able to give her her uh, proper round of a pause and, and, and send off. So that's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Thanks for that, Butch. I concur and uh, hope to see Gilly at a, at a banquet at some point. Phil? I also concur and um, would uh, suggest a round of, of applause for Gilly and her great contribution to the CPSAS and the council process. All right, unmute and applaud. Thank you very much. I'm blushing here in front of my computer. I appreciate that. Well, if we haven't brought you to tears yet, we haven't yet done our job. <laughs> Thanks, Gilly, for everything. And um, I, I'm sure, and I certainly hope we'll still see you around. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And are there any other questions on the CPSAS report? I'm not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much, Gilly, for everything. So that concludes uh, all of our reports and takes us to public comment. And we have a number of comments here. So we'll start in the order on the screen, uh, I think. Uh, Mike Conroy followed by John Keppen. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Chair. Just confirming you can hear me. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Mike Conroy on behalf of the Pacific Coast 
Federation of Fishermen's Associations. Uh, before I go into the comments that I've submitted to the briefing book, I do want to note that three days ago, a multi multi-party memorandum of agreement was announced, which paves the way to the removal of the Klamath Dams in early 2023. Um, this is going to lead to the restoration of a 255-mile river and its storied salmon runs, which are important to a great number of users, cultures, and economies. Under the agreement, states California and Oregon will serve as co-licensees or guarantors of the removal project able to provide financing in the unlikely event of unexpected costs or damages. Financing has already been secured for the expected costs of removal. This provided enough comfort for Pacifico, owner of the dam, to proceed. The deal still needs approval by FERC, and we are hopeful this will not be unnecessarily delayed. We wish to offer appreciation to all involved in this lengthy and protracted process, but do want to especially thank Governors Brown and Newsom, Chairs James and Atterbury, and Mr. Mr. Branson and Root for executing this monumental MOA. PCFFA, of course, is not only a signature party to the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement that this latest MOA helps complete and move forward, but also played a major role in pushing for removal of the Ford Klamath Dams, building on past PCFFA President Nate Bingham's work to restore the Klamath River salmon runs since the mid 80s. Klamath Dam is Klamath Dam removals benefits for northern and southern Oregon salmon fisheries, especially KMZ ports, would be enormous in the coming years, potentially doubling current returns to the Klamath and greatly diminishing or eliminating weak stock management closures like we have seen for so many years. Uh, we mentioned the dams for two reasons. One, to give some much earned kudos to those who helped this day come and two, to advise the council that with the proposed 2023 removal date, this subject may be coming before you in 2021, 22, and beyond, including a request to analyze managed objectives for the stocks that stand to benefit. Hopefully, we can all celebrate this item's removal from the council's plate sooner as opposed to later. And now I want to circle back to the written comments that we submitted in advance uh, of this meeting. Um, at the outset of this meeting, during open public comment, we spoke of the importance of the open access ground fish fishery to our member associations and other similarly situated fishermen and women along the coast. Today, we come back to you with specific requests based on that comment. We specifically ask that the council, one, remove the shading in the proposed meeting agenda for the Emily Platt EFP under regulations for April, so that, that's scoping, and direct the management team to analyze two alternatives. One, to elim elimination of RCAs, as there are currently no ground fish stocks which are listed as overfished, or two, removal of restrictions imposed on open access fisheries utilizing non-bottom contact gear types in non-trawl RCAs. We note something similar has been asked of the council before. We believe the time is right for these items to be formally scheduled and not put over to a later time. We are fearful that loss of opportunity in our primary fisheries decrabbed salmon will occur with more frequency and will become more dependent on the open access ground fish fishery to keep our small businesses economically viable. As noted earlier in the meeting, this not only benefits us, but benefits our local fishing and coastal communities, businesses which are reliant upon our operations, and local seafood consumers who prefer to consume seafood supply by their local harvesters. As the GMT performs the request analysis, we would expect enforcement and accountability measures be considered which would conform to existing hook and line methods, including VMS and observer coverage. We acknowledge the concerns raised by CDFW in their November 2nd comment letter, on the proposed rule in the 2021-22 vinyl spec and management measures and commit to work with them to arrive at solutions to those concerns. Additionally, we stand ready to assist in the analysis per, by providing comments and insight into how to design an economically beneficial fishery which is sustainable and here's the rebuilding plans for any stock deemed overfished in the future. And that concludes my comments, thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. Let's see if there are any questions. Um, of Mike, Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, uh, Mike. I want to echo um, the message that you're bringing to the council today about uh, the major milestone this week um, in the uh, MOU uh, regarding the Klamath Dam removal. Um, this is definitely a topic that will be of great attention um, to the council. Um, 
and appreciate uh, work of, um, again, several of the Habitat Committee members that I'm sure will keep us up to date on the progress of this item. And then um, as we um, look to um, how um, the issue will impact our discussions um, with regard to salmon management, um, as well as hearing more from NIMS on um, revisions to biological opinions uh, and other ESA um, discussions that are likely to ensue. Um, I think bringing this info to us in uh, agenda planning is exactly where um, it belongs. And while, you know, I don't think we need any scheduling um, on our year at a glance, um, I think it's, it is, um, another item that, um, is certainly of great importance to our council. So thank you again, um, for bringing it up here today and we will, um, follow along. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Marcy. Any further questions of Mike? All right. Uh, John. Kepin, followed by Bill James. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Let me confirm that you can hear me. Yes, indeed. Thank you. In June of the 2018 council meeting under agenda item E.4, attachment five, appendix B, which is titled consideration of changes to the yellow eye up rockfish rebuilding plan. There is a sentence on page eight that summarizes what the small vessel fleet has attempted to impress on the council in the November 2020 session. That sentence reads, West Coast communities depend on a portfolio of commercial and recreational fisheries to support year round operations. There were 43 postings to open comments favoring increased access to the RCA north of the 3427 prior to the opening of the council floor. Three of those comments were Fishermen's Association. One was PCFFA who made public comment on council floor. And in total, over a hundred small vessel commercial fishermen shared with the council that access to the RCA is critical to our long-term survival. Their call to action is more acute than ever as California commercial salmon fleet considers at least the same level of salmon restriction in 2021 as in 2020, if not more, and crab fishermen face a delayed fishery due to whale entanglement avoidance no certainty to the length of their season and forced early in to relatively fast seasons. You have any idea how difficult it is to get two fishermen to agree, much less to get a hundred to act on something and stand up and be counted? My message is clear, Mr. Chairman. West Coast commercial communities depend on a healthy portfolio of year-round fisheries to survive, shrinking, or even eliminating the RCA so that open access participants have access to year round and bridging fishery is vital to the long term health of the small vessel fleet and their communities. We respectively ask the Council to prioritize analysis of the of RCA for open access sector, move vertical and non and horizontal non ground ground contact. EFPs into regulation and retention of rockfish in the troll fishery as the highest priority for the 2021 council session. A minimum of eight California harbors, 100 fisher persons, and numerous support services, along with the associated of coastside based jobs, are dependent upon your decision. Thank you for the opportunity and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you, John. Any questions of John? Not seeing any. Thanks, John, for your testimony. Uh, Bill James, followed by Heather Mann.
Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Absolutely, Bill. Uh, my name is Bill James. I'm representing myself in Port St. Louis Commercial Fishermen's Association. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I agree with both of the uh, two former uh, speakers. Um, and it's probably more than 100 people. It's probably closer to 500 if you really talk about it up and down the coast. I know that most of my port is, is desperately needing um, that access. Um, in the uh, upcoming future planning, I think what we really should have is an overarching principle of thinking of it as food production and food security. Myself, I grew up with a pandemic of polio, and now I'm in my later years dealing with another one. And it takes a long time to make a uh, raise a beef or a, or a pig. So fish, it's already grown, it's out there. And us open access fishermen can provide between, in one day of fishing, a couple guys out there fishing can food for probably a thousand people or more every day that they're fishing. When the big market, when the big uh, producers back where the packing plants are or whatever, you know, with beef and pork and whatever, chickens, can't produce food, we can't. So again, I really want to stress the economics and really get us out there with access. Second thing, I think one of the things that's lacking is the decent economic analysis, as stated by some of the uh, former uh, uh, discussions going. And I uh, forwarded in my open public comment the uh, idea of an implant um, idea of economic research. And uh, I'd like to say that Ed Waters is a, uh, has been a contractor before with, your, with the uh, council. And maybe uh, getting him his uh, PhD dissertation was on the implant. So he's well versed with it. I think that would be really a good way to uh, do Dover Soul and Sable Fish rather than all the rhetoric that's going around without, without the actual numbers. I think numbers will really help the council um, make a decision in the future and also having a decent economic. Um, analysis will also give the council and the governments, both state and federal, more idea of how much we can produce, and uh, have produced, and will could produce. So also moving on my third, um, yellow eye is a really constraining stock for us, and the hell of it um, 7.848 metric tons gave no description of who caught it, where it was caught, how deep, or any of that stuff. So I suggest, I, I also forwarded um, a file in my open public comment earlier about the uh, analysis of the way Jason, Janet, uh, and myself developed for um, earlier with a nearshore fishery. And one of the complaints I heard was that some of the stuff couldn't be done because of confidentiality. Well, with the observer coverage, basically what they need to do is make sure that three, three people in California are observed, three people in Oregon, a minimum, are observed, three people in Washington. Because that's all we really need is who's catching it in what state. You know, then we can deal with things in a more rational uh, way. Fourth, um, HR 8632. That scares me to death. As Oceans Based Climate Solutions Act. I watched the uh, National Resource um, Committee um, on November 7th, 17th and listen to all the speakers. And uh, I, I would advise everybody, including the council, to listen to those conversations. I think you'll get a real good idea how serious this is. 
I was involved in the California MLPA's process for the first two go-rounds. Go On the third go-round, um, I commented, and our South Central area was just pummeled with more MPAs than we ever needed. So this is something that really needs attention. And so uh, please, uh, I encourage everybody to start writing right away on uh, this because that bill includes a lot of things that people can agree on other than the fishing stuff. And I think they're just kind of sneaking it in to get it passed. And then we have a nightmare. All the work we've done at the council will go away if that bill goes gets passed. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you, Bill. Are there any thanks for those comments? Appreciate them. Any questions for Bill? Thanks, Bill. Thank you. So, uh, Heather Mann, followed by Anna Weinstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. My name is Heather Mann, and I represent the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. I'd like to touch on a few topics under this agenda item. I'll start with future action related to short belly rockfish and then spend the balance of my testimony identifying MTC's priorities moving into 2021. So first related to short belly. Following the October meeting, I reached out to Anna Weinstein at Audubon. I did this for a few reasons. I wanted to more fully understand Anna's concerns related to the health of the California lease turn and in general, understand concerns about access to short belly as a forage fish for birds. Um, I also wanted to share with Anna how the whiting fisheries work, how our co-ops function, and how a directed fishery for short belly for human consumption was not realistic. She accepted my invitation and we spent what I felt was a very productive hour on a Zoom meeting discussing these issues. Uh, we have a lot more in common than I would have thought, and by the end of the meeting, one thing had become clear to me. Her main concern was around a directed fishery for short belly developing, not for human consumption, but for a reduction fishery that would then feed aquaculture operations. Frankly, I had not really considered this before, and I agree with her that this is not a desirable outcome for a variety of reasons. From a catcher vessel perspective, I have a hard time believing a reduction fishery for short belly would be profitable. But as I said in testimony earlier in the week, just saying something, even with the best of intentions, does not automatically make it true. To that end, I committed to her that I would be willing to explore ways that we could formalize a prohibition on a directed fishery developing in the future for short belly. The sticking point for me is <clears throat> how to do that without being overly burdensome or punitive to the catcher vessels. Because as I have testified uh, many times, when we catch short belly in our fishing operations, it's a mistake and not something we can more easily deal with as we could um, say with a rockfish. Processors do not want short belly, <clears throat> excuse me, and we rarely get paid for them. Short belly reduces the quality of any other fish in the hold. And in general, they're a nuisance for the catcher vessel wasting time and fuel and making the trip a financial loser. At the same time, if someone does catch short belly and they have an opportunity to get any money for it, I'd like to see that happen because the trip is going to be a financial loser, even if they receive a small payment for the short belly. I also believe that if short belly is delivered shoreside or at sea, then the disposition should include an option to make meal versus put it in the dumpster. So the million dollar question is how do we formalize a prohibition on a directed fishery for short belly without penalizing the harvesters and processors who find themselves with this unwanted fish. Taking the time to talk with Anna and understand her concerns while also having her learn about our fisheries and the challenges we are up against was really valuable to me and I hope for her as well. In the end, the process will benefit because we can work together to solve this issue. So get your tape recorders ready. I have changed my previous stance and I support the council scheduling consideration of this issue in the future. However, I can't stress enough that it will be important to get the details right to successfully achieve the objectives of all the stakeholders, but I'm ready to come to the table and do that in a collaborative way through the council process. And I really appreciate Anna being receptive to my outreach. 
In terms of the MTC priorities moving into 2021, it is critical to keep the mothership utilization issue moving forward. For 2020, the sector harvested just 41% of our allocation, leaving over 122 million pounds of hake to swim. At a conservative eight cents per pound, that's just under $10 million in excess of revenue. In a year like 2020, even 1 million additional dollars would be a huge benefit to participants. And this isn't just about boat owners, I'm talking about crew members, suppliers, grocery stores, fuel docks, shipyards, all the money that vessel owners spend on actually participating in the fishery and then after the fishery when we're maintaining our vessels. Over the last six years, the sector has left over 481 million pounds of fish in the water. That's worth a conservative $40 million. The industry, in good faith, took the council's direction and held a sector-wide meeting outside the council process to discuss this issue and bring suggested fixes to the council. And we did that in November of 2018. We have taken the controversy out of the issue by only moving forward consensus solutions. This makes your job much easier. You guys further condense the alternatives to eliminate the opportunity for processors to follow their catcher vessels into California waters. So there really isn't anything left that is controversial. And I would argue you are ready to identify a range of alternatives in March. Also, this issue has been on the radar since 2016. This is not a new issue. This fishery is not performing as it was intended to. It certainly is not meeting Magnuson Act standards 1, 5, 7, 8, and 10. The Council has prioritized this issue more than once, and I would ask that you please keep it on the schedule for 2021. I am confident that the season start date change would result in immediate benefits to the sector. Over the last three years, an average of 47 million pounds of hake was delivered to motherships during the first two weeks of the fishery. In fact, over the last two years, 50% of all the fish landed in the sector came in the first two weeks. If the fishery opens two weeks earlier, there is an expectation that at least that much fish would be delivered to motherships during those weeks. And there are over a thousand people that are involved in the mothership sector. MTC supports keeping the gear switching agenda item moving forward in 2021. That issue has uh, also developed out of the five-year review process and the participants on all sides deserve to have a resolution sooner rather than later. The cost recovery issue in the trawl sector must also be addressed. While the state of California and others don't want to see resources put toward this issue, it is patently unfair for trawl participants to be paying millions of dollars annually for something they do not support and are not satisfied with and actually don't quite even understand what they're paying for. This is also not a new issue. This has been a concern for many, many years as evidenced by this meeting's gap report and the long public record on this topic. <clears throat> in general, I do try to support all fisheries and sectors. It bothers me greatly when we are pitted against each other vying for council time because it creates unnecessary discord between sectors. It's especially frustrating under the current circumstances and years long capacity issues with NIMPS. All of us, commercial and recreational, all sectors, we all deserve to have our fisheries managed to the benefit of the participants, the resource and the nation. And as council members, you all have the difficult responsibility to manage all federal fisheries to the MSA standards, whether the fishery occurs off your state or not, whether you like the fishery or not. I cannot help but point out that the trawl sector in particular faces extreme challenges and expenses to operate, more so than any other fishery sector, not the least of which is being 100% accountable on our own dime, 200% if you include the duplicative processor monitoring. We spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on co-op management and sea state to help us prosecute our fisheries in a responsible way. We impose voluntary restrictions, costly restrictions on our fleets to live up to our commitments to salmon fishermen and others to do everything we can to avoid Chinook. We don't have to do that, but we do. Since 2014, the trawl fleet has paid over $27 million to the government, $27 million over six years to participate in the trawl fishery, $27 million coming directly off the top of each delivery. $27 million that could be going to crew members, gear development, boat maintenance, communities, product development, and the like. Bumping trawl issues off the priority list to focus on things like access to the non-trawl RCA creates major heartburn. 
those vessels are not 100% accountable and they don't face the same high hardwired expenses the trawl fleets do. Do not get me wrong, I fully support those vessels having more access to the non-trawl RCA, but we have to address what is not working in the trawl ITQ program first. Don't let the fact that there are a lot of comment letters in this meeting's briefing book outweigh the many hours of oral testimony delivered by industry and reams of written public comment you have received over the last several years on the very real problems with our existing trawl program. I would also note that under the virtual world, the council has asked us to limit duplicative comments to expedite the work of the council. So don't interpret our silence or lack of fishermen testifying on this agenda item as an indication that these issues are not critically important to address. Rather, it's out of respect to the council process that we have avoided multitude of duplicative comments. If number of public comments is how we are going to gauge priorities, I have no doubt that the trial fleet can produce a significant amount of written and oral public comments. In closing, Mr. Chairman, council members, thank you for your hard work. Please keep mothership utilization, gear switching, and cost recovery on the agenda for 2021, and let's address short belly sometime in the future. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Heather. Louise M. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your testimony, Heather. You've always been very supportive of uh, all fisheries on, on the West Coast, and I understand your frustration. I look back on, on my time in the gap and, and the discussions that we had years ago about this and some of the stuff that I thought we had uh, uh, all agreed on, and, and yet you rightfully point out that uh, we haven't done the, uh, the motions, the movements, to, uh, to satisfy your very, very appropriate comments. So I just wanted to thank you very much and also point out uh, the, uh, the wonderful outreach that you uh, made to our uh, new uh, member, uh, Anna Weinstein. And uh, I, I would have liked to have been a, a uh, somebody, a spider on the wall, because I'm sure I would have learned a, a lot from your discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Louie. Uh, Butch Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Mann, for your 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 testimony. And and uh, I, I will I will say that uh, I, for one, uh, appreciate the openness um, that you have uh, done with the salmon industry and. Uh, couldn't ask for a better partner um, than the trawl industry and being open and and letting us know what's going on. Uh, sometimes I think to a to, to which could be considered too many, and and that's a good thing. Um, so I, I I have seen and and I recognize the commitment the trawl industry has um, and the importance it has to the coastal communities and and I for one thank you um, and the trawl industry for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Butch. All right. Are there any questions for Heather? Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Anna Weinstein, followed by Jeff Shester. Good morning, Mr. Chair and council members. Can you hear me? Uh, good morning, Anna. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Well, um, first, I would be remiss if I didn't express my gratitude um, to Mr. Anderson and Mr. Smith and the council for my appointment to the CPSAS um, and also to my NGO colleagues who supported me. I'm honored to, to have been appointed and I will serve to the very best of my abilities. Uh, so I um, have two workload planning items to speak to today. Uh, first on short belly rockfish. Um, so I thank Heather Mann uh, for her remarks and I'm, I'm very grateful she reached out to me Indeed, our, our conversation was extremely valuable uh, to me on a number of levels. Uh, while I still have a ton to learn, I'm much better informed uh, than, uh, than before we connected. Uh, and I appreciate her will the willingness she's expressed uh, as an industry leader to explore ways to formalize a prohibition on a directed fishery developing in the future on short belly rockfish. So I hope the council will suggest today some, some timing uh, for when that would be a right time to start that process. Um, so why is this so important? Um, the council has noted in its fishery ecosystem plan 
Small pelagic fish form a critical link in the upwelling driven high production regions of the California current ecosystem. And the fishery ecosystem plan named short belly as one of the six most abundant of these key fish for supporting higher trophic levels. The specter of a directed fishery for fish meal for aquaculture comes into focus when reading, for example, World Bank reports stating that every year millions of tons of wild fish are caught to feed farm raised fish, and the fish meal price is one limiting factor in the growth of aquaculture worldwide. Uh, so, from my perspective today, um, an ideal outcome uh, would be an FMP amendment establishing a general prohibition on directed fishing, fishing for short belly, followed by regulations uh, implementing the prohibition. Um, and as, as, uh, as Heather notes, she and the knowledgeable people on the, the GMT, the GAP, and the council staff uh, would need to sort through what, what she calls the million dollar question, how to formalize a prohibition um, without penalizing the harvesters and processors who find themselves uh, with this unwanted fish. And meanwhile, the council can separately address the need to keep incidental catch at the precautionary levels that exist uh, through in-season reporting and council follow-up uh, when incidental catch, um, if and when it, it starts to approach the 2,000 ton trigger for council consideration. Um, okay, and then the second item I'm speaking on behalf of, of Pew Trusts and Audubon, um, uh, as well as the four other conservation groups um, that signed uh, in regard to our September 2020 letter to the council. This is in regard to central subpopulation northern anchovy agenda items. So, um, so we urge the council to, um, to take today to unshade June and November CPS agenda items, um, specifically CSNA management framework for June and FME, FMP management categories for November. Uh, we appreciate the CPSMT's um, requests, including um, its report today to the council since March to take up these items. Uh, and additionally, and finally, we'd like to reiterate our support um, for incorporating the CSNA OFL framework uh, into, the, um, into the FMP of via an FMP amendment, rather than look to two separate FMP amendments, one for management categories and another to incorporate the OFL framework. Uh, we point to the CPSMT September 2020 workload planning statement, which reads, if council chooses to pursue the CSNA framework, the MT recommends FMP revisions be considered June 2021 or some sub subsequent meeting. This timing could allow the CPSMT to incorporate the CSNA framework into the draft revised FMP. So it sounds to us um, that the council you know, may today consider changing FMP management categories um, for November 2021 to FMP amendment um, in, the, in, the, in the year at a glance and other plans to show council intent. So um, thank you so much for taking my, my comments. Uh, thank you for your hard work and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Anna. Are there any questions of Anna on her public comment? Thank you, Anna. Uh, Jeff Chester. Hi, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council. This is Jeff Chester representing Oceana. Um, uh, first, uh, wanted to address some of the CPS uh, items uh, on your future workload, uh, specifically to address the, the longstanding legal concerns with anchovy management uh, that were raised uh, earlier at this meeting. Uh, it is important for the council to commit to amending the CPS FMP to adopt a new management framework for anchovy as soon as possible. A single FMP amendment that adopts a new framework for anchovy as well as removing the active versus monitored terminology to clarify the management for each CPS stock, we believe is the most efficient path forward. Uh, scoping a CPS FMP amendment to address the management categories was previously scheduled for June 2020, but was removed, uh, hence the, the, the urgent need to, to see this move forward now. Uh, we see the, anch the anchovy framework is tentatively scheduled for June, but it is not clear that this would actually be uh, adopted in an FMP amendment, which is the critical piece. Uh, we would ask that the council clarify now that the agenda item is to initiate scoping of an FMP amendment, and we ask the council to push this forward to the April meeting and schedule final action on the amendment for November 2021. Uh, also, re with respect to Pacific Sardine, we wanted to reiterate our request that the council direct the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and SSC to review 
uh, the SSC's current formula that uses the Cal Coffee three-year index for setting sardine over fishing limits. Given the published analysis by the Southwest Fishery Science Center scientists that it is no longer an appropriate index and given uh, the large discrepancies between the productivities uh, produced by that index and the recent productivities in the 2020 stock assessment indicate that sardines have had historically extremely low productivity for the last decade. Uh, with respect to um, short belly rockfish, uh, we uh, very much uh, appreciate hearing uh, about the, the conversation between Heather Mann and, and Anna Weinstein to find common ground. Uh, we, we are also hoping to see a new agenda item for groundfish added to consider a directed fishing prohibition for short belly rockfish. Uh, we understand uh, the need to work with uh, industry to get the details right uh, and answer the, the million dollar question. And, uh, and we think this can be done similarly to how the prohibition on other forage fish was accomplished several years ago for the shared ecosystem component species uh, in the fishery ecosystem plans forage, forage initiative, uh, AKA uh, CBA-1. Um, and then lastly, on uh, HMS issues, uh, we support a deep set buoy gear discussion in March, and, and, but we do also support uh, pushing back considerations of hard caps to the extent possible. Um, rather than working on hard caps or in developing a weakened version of those, we'd really like to see the council uh, schedule consideration of how to best uh, handle a phase out of federal drift gill net permits consistent with the California State Transition Program established in Senate Bill 1017. And note, uh, as, I, uh, as I first announced uh, at the end of the last council meeting that um, Oceana has con can contributed over a million dollars uh, now to that uh, state uh, drift gill net transition fund. Uh, and, and we are happy to see uh, such interest from the fleet in, in participating and hope to, uh, to see that transition program go to fruition. Uh, rather than uh, and, and figure out how to make the federal process and permits consistent, rather than um, trying to figure out how to, how to weaken the current existing regulations that limit bycatch in the drift gill net fishery. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and attention. And just also thank you over this last year for all your, your patience and, and, and slogging through everything uh, in light of the, the unprecedented COVID situation and the, and the switch to remote meetings. Um, we've appreciated the, the council's professionalism in that transition and uh, uh, hope that we can uh, come back to in-person meetings and, and have another banquet again soon. Thank you uh, and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jeff. Are there any questions for Jeff? All right. We have uh, Jeff Lackey followed by Sarah Nayani. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you. My name is Jeff Lackey. Thank you for your time, council members. I'll, I'll keep this extremely brief. I support comments made by Heather Mann, and in, in advance, I support comments by Sarah Nani. I urge the council to keep gear switching moving as quickly as the process allows because the trawl fishery and communities are in need. Thank you, and that's uh, all I have now. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions for Jeff? All right, Sarah Nayani. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to you all. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, loud and clear, thanks, Sarah. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, I'm providing comments today on behalf of Arctic Storm Management Group. Uh, we operate the Arctic Storm and the Arctic Fjord, which are two mothership processors and then Sea Storm, which is our catcher vessel that participates in both the whiting and non-whiting fishing in the shoreside sector, um, as well as the mothership sector. Arctic Storm and Arctic Fjord just wrapped up our fall whiting operations one week ago. Um, this year, our catcher vessel partners delivered over 50 million pounds to our two platforms, and that totaled 62% of what came out of the water for the mothership sector this year. This occurred with significant effort during an incredibly different, difficult year from all of our catcher vessel partners and um, the crew on our platforms, as well as our HR department, accounting department, um, our ops team, compliance, all the teams that keep these vessels going. There's a lot of people involved. And um, as you've heard many times, it, it was 
made much more difficult um, with all of the COVID challenges. Um, but this spring was some of the best fishing that our company has ever seen. And we were delighted to have several successful days in November before the weather kicked up. Um, that's not typical for late fall fishing. As Heather mentioned, um, the mothership fishery has only had about 40% attainment of the MS allocation this year. Obviously with COVID, there were a lot of contributing factors, but for a year when fishing was this good, we should have had way more out of the water. This sector has come close to full attainment in the past, and I think we can again, um, but we really need your help to do that. So I'm here today to ask you to keep mothership utilization on the agenda for March um, and encourage the great analytical work that Jesse and Brett have been working on to continue. Um, without counting the discussions on mothership utilization that occurred since the 2015 five-year review public hearings, um, this topic has come up at the following meetings. September 2018 in Seattle, where I requested that the council consider an increase to the 45% cap, and several catcher vessels came forward at that time to discuss issues that they were having in the sector. November 2018 in San Diego, where Heather and Brent provided a summary of the October industry meeting that Heather mentioned um, and that they organized. March 2019 in Vancouver, where we presented detailed information on several pro proposals, including proposed regulatory text changes. Um, June 2019 in San Diego, under workload and new management measures um, and under future workload. September and November 2019 in Boise and Costa Mesa under future workload. The GAP scoped the issue in March and April 2020 and submitted our informational report with the suite of five alternatives in June 2020. And then the council scoped the issue in September 2020. Uh, and then this meeting as well. So from what I can tell from my quick review of the briefing books, that's at least 10 meetings that this issue has come up. We're very thankful for the time and consideration from the council, and we are and have been ready to move forward and get this through to help our sector. Um, we've done our best to work collaboratively to come up with the solutions that have been proposed, and I believe that a lot of these solutions could significantly help our sector. Um, and so I just would like to request that that remain on the agenda for March. I know that workload is very difficult for everyone this year and I understand that but um, I guess as a new participant in the council process I'm just having a hard time understanding um, when the industry comes together and does what's requested it's just hard hard to understand how it might be several more years before some of this um, can be you know analyzed and implemented through the regulatory process. So I'm so thankful for everything you've done and I just hope we can keep that moving. I understand it might be a while before we get regs, but we really need to get this um, moving forward in a timely manner. So thank you so much for your consideration and um, really appreciate all of your efforts on the council, especially during this difficult year when we've had all these virtual meetings. Um, I know it's hard and I wish we could all <laughs> See each other in the hallways and have a drink after the meetings to sort of help <laughs> help with all the stress. But I really appreciate your time and efforts. And I'm always here if anyone wants to talk about the mothership sector or things we can do to improve um, the fishery. So thanks again. Thank you very much, Sarah. Are there questions for Sarah? Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks, Sarah, for the explanation there in a historical perspective. I, I had a question just occurred to me that, you know, we've heard a lot of testimony throughout the different um, sectors about market demand and how that, how COVID affected market demand. And my understanding is the market is not, you know, the, the marketability of, and the demand for the whiting product is 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 not the constraining factor here. In fact, it's quite high, and to my knowledge, is and that actually it's the structural components of the mothership sector some that are that are uh, that are outlined in this mothership proposal that are the things that are prohibiting uh, more utilization 
in in the mothership sector. Is is that a correct assumption? Am I am I thinking about this right? Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Julie, through the chair. Um, yeah, I can only speak to what my company is seeing. I know that obviously we make different products at sea because we make Serimi and um, we have filet products, PBO. Um, that's a little bit different than some of the shoreside products. So I'll just frame frame my response with that acknowledgement. Um, but we are seeing very high demand um, for Hake products. I think there's a lot going on with the Pollock market and the Hake market that's sort of intertwined when um, Pollock is short, there may be increased demand for some products of whiting. And so um, at least from our company's perspective, we're seeing increased demand and we would like to put out more product than we currently are. All right, thanks for that, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Sarah, for your testimony. Uh, and for an update on um, kind of what's going on with um, the mothership utilization um, agenda item. Um, I'm hoping that maybe you can um, put a little flush on the bones for me here. Um, I asked a question earlier um, regarding the March agenda, the way the item um, is phrased um, refers to scoping of mothership utilization. And I'm I'm hearing you say how important it is to expeditiously move ahead on this item. And I guess I'm hoping to learn a little more about um, where you feel um, more scoping is needed, or you know, maybe you can add a little more about why. Um, the item that we're looking to agendize um, is a second scoping session. Um, I, I thought we left the September discussion with a pretty clear path of about four items that we thought could be done with some degree of efficiency. And now it kind of sounds like there's some um, new information that suggests that we need to slow down or do more work. Um, so maybe you can enlighten me on that. I, I also heard you mention that there's great analytical work going on um, from Jesse and Brett. I'm curious about that statement um, just because I, I didn't know that there was a lot of analytical work going on um, by these council staffers on this item. Um, so maybe you can kind of bring me up to date a little more on what's going on in the background and, and where you see things being with this item. Thank you so much, Ms. Uremko, through the chair um, for the question. Yeah, so my understanding was similar to yours as well, that we came out of the September meeting with a suite of four alternatives that the council would be ready to consider at a future date. And so maybe I'm misunderstanding the council process, but it seems to me like we're ready for um, consideration of a range of alternatives. Um, so I, I, may be, I may be missing something there and I apologize if I am, but um, I feel like we've had a pretty clear suite of alternatives since at least March of this past year um, of 2020. And so um, that included, you know, the the alternatives that you guys considered in September and discussed. And so my personal opinion is that we have we have a good suite to look at and, and the council has repeatedly asked the industry to work together collaboratively to come up with that and we have done that. And I think our intention in doing that was to save the council a lot of time um, with scoping and, and just kind of move right to what the industry has established would be helpful for our sector. So I really appreciate your comments there and um, I, you know, not knowing all of the council process and the measures that um, the council needs to take in order to move to a range of alternatives. I personally thought that that's where we were headed for March um, if this item were to be unshaded. So I look, I look forward to more discussion from the council there. On the second piece, um, I apologize if I misstated um, that that's probably my fault. Jesse Dorfinghouse had reached out to me 
um, and I believe several other members of the industry to sort of clarify the alternatives that were discussed in September and try to get more information on whether additional alternatives should be included. And then just kind of like talk about, which I really appreciate her doing, I'm just trying to understand what the industry concerns and dynamics are and sort of how we came up with a suite of alternatives. And I, I believe, I mean, this is how I understood it. And again, I might need to be clarified here, but um, I thought that that was to support some future analytical work or analytical document that um, that perhaps her and some council staff were working on. So I might have mischaracterized where that page is at, but I just want to so thank her for the willingness to reach out and try to understand the issues that our industry is facing and sort of how we as an industry came up with this suite of alternatives. So I hope that I hope that helps answer um, your questions and thanks, thanks again for your consideration. All right, any further questions of Sarah? All right, that uh, concludes uh, public comment and will take us to council action, which includes a fair amount of discussion probably. Uh, we will take a, a short break here and my hope is that we can return and conclude this agenda item without the need for a lunch break, but um, time will tell. Uh, let's be back here at 11.37, 10 minute break.
All right. Well, welcome back. Let's uh, get started on the task at hand, which uh, is to nail down the March and April agendas and make any changes to the year at a glance. So um, we've had a lot of public comment. We've had a lot of uh, requests from the advisory bodies. So at this point, I will ask Executive, Direc Executive Director Chuck Tracy to take over for the balance of this process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, uh, so I think my plan here is to start with the March quick reference and then do the April quick reference and then take a look at the year at a glance. So that's where we're going to be stepping through this and have Sandra uh, project whichever these documents we're looking at on the shared screen so you'll be able to see them um so uh just kind of a on a quick overview of both for both the march and april i, I would note that um you know that what's on there right now obviously we've got some uh some changes to make but uh what's on there right now are uh days that last uh seven to seven and a half hours for the most part uh, which is um, maybe a little longer than I guess I would uh, was hoping we might be at. Uh, you know, for this council meeting, we had uh, six to six and a half hours. So, um, and I thought this meeting worked out pretty pretty well. Um, so I don't know if uh, you know if that's uh, how the council feels about that. But uh, to the extent that uh, we can, um, if we have a target, uh, I guess I'd like to like to know about it um and um if, if we're okay with seven seven and a half hours that we're willing to go there go there as well <clears throat> so um so that kind of is uh, maybe an underlying uh, feature of, of those things um i guess i would uh, I, I did kind of want to touch bases real quick i don't know, know if i want to have the entire discussion right now but i did want to touch bases on the uh um mothership uh agenda item and the uh scoping issue <clears throat> so you know after kind of shaking my uh my mental tree a little bit um you know i i think part of the reason that both well actually both mothership and the and the uh, non-troll uh emily platt business were put on these agendas as scoping um while, while there had there has been some work done on um on identifying the uh on scoping in, in terms of identifying purpose and need statements and identifying issues uh, you know part of the reason they ended up where they did was actually because they were also identified as the uh, the two items under the executive order 13921 that uh, that we were required to identify for magnus and act projects uh, that we could identify prior to may 2nd um, and so I, I think that's that's part of the reason they appeared uh, where they did, and I think part of the reason they appeared how they did in terms of scoping uh, was maybe just a little, bit, still a little bit of uncertainty with uh, the capacity of, um, of both NIMS, given their uh, staff transitions, and and the GMT as well, because uh, there are some staff, there's some transition occurring there. Um, so I, so I think that uh, that left the a uh, little bit of question in people's minds of how how far we might be able to do. Uh, get um, in terms of developing um, alternatives. Uh, so uh, I, I think that's probably why they why they ended up that way. The, uh, we, we did note in the decision summary document that that was the decision to to ad do additional scoping as part of a you know a three meeting process for that for those uh, those topics. Um, that being said, uh, you know we're we're hopefully a little. Uh, a little wiser now, and uh, to the extent the council, uh, you know, wants to wants to weigh in on on the uh, what the action would be under those agenda items, that's certainly fair game here. Um, I, I do know there's some, uh, I know there's at least one issue that the National Fishery Services plans on bringing up in regards in regards to that, uh, particularly the mothership, one of the um, issues, and uh, and I guess just also for terminology clarification. Um, for um, things used a little differently, but 
So uh, when I'm talking about scoping, I'm talking about uh, developing of a purpose and need statement and identifying the issues that will be uh, considered and that, that where there will be alternatives developed to address the issues. And so for, for the mothership, you know, the issues that the council has uh, uh, is talking about now or the, you know, the, uh, uh, the writing start date, the processor obligation deadline, processor cap, uh, the, and the permit transfers. Uh, so th those are the issues. And then the alternatives would be, you know, there'd be alternatives developed for each one of those just to kind of keep the, uh, the terminology, um, at least that, that's, how, uh, that's how I think about it. That's how I think they're uh, considered in the sort of the NEPA framework as well. So I uh, just, just wanted to, to get that out there. Um, so, um, so again, I'm, I'm not sure I want to go quite all in on that topic right this second. Um, maybe so. Maybe we could. Uh, maybe I can go through a couple of uh, maybe some other low-hanging fruit on March, and then uh, that that'll uh, carry us uh, naturally into the discussion about the, the more challenging issues. So, so uh, looking at uh, Thursday, March fourth, um, there's a couple three shaded items there. <clears throat> Uh, the research and data needs update. Um, <clears throat> I think that's a good, um, I guess I would like to see that. Uh, we had hoped to do that actually, you know, uh, sometime in, in calendar year 20, uh, but, uh, but here it is in 21. Um, as Pete noted, there's, uh, there's a number of um, things that uh, are probably deserving of some council attention before the process goes too much further. So to make sure that uh, um, we don't get uh, uh, down some rabbit holes, as I, I believe is how he mentioned it uh, in my discussions with him. So I, I guess I would like to see that stay there, uh, but, it, but it's not essential. Uh, the regional operating agreement, that is something that, uh, well, um, that, that's the agreement between the, the Region, the science centers, uh, the uh, OLE and, and GC, and the council staff. That how we go about uh, finalizing council actions and, and working together and those sorts of things. Um, this is again something that we were hoping that we would have been able to make some more progress on, uh, but but frankly, it just hasn't uh, hasn't been able to um, crack the priority list for for me uh, at least for council staff. Um, so uh, I, I guess I'm thinking that that is something that, uh, again, I, I just see um, this upcoming year that that is, uh, or at least the upcoming spring part of the year, that, that that's going to be a difficult thing for me to spend much time on and, and to uh, expect to bring something to the council for their consideration. I'm not, I'm not very hopeful about that. It is something that uh, you know that uh, we're going to work on a little bit as 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 we can. Uh, National Marine Fisheries Service as well, and we continue to have discussions about it. Uh, so I, I guess I would uh, put that one up there um, as an opportunity for you know to, uh, to cut something out of the March agenda. If um, you know if there are developments, uh, those, those are the probably the sorts of things that I could identify under my executive director's report, just to keep the council in the loop and, and what the status of that project is and if there's any issues that need uh, council's attention. Um, for the salmon nymphs report on that day, we've got 30 minutes. Uh, sounds like uh, we might need to expand that a little bit um, for, uh, I think Barry has some comments that he would like to uh, pass on to the council relative to some salmon business. And then we've got the reintroduction above Cooley, Grand Cooley Dam. Uh, so this is something that's, again, kind of been delayed a couple times. Um, but uh, so it, it's landed here, again, an opportunity. It's a salmon-related issue. And uh, th these are the salmon meetings. So if we don't get to that, I'm not sure uh, when we would be able to. For uh, March 5th, uh, there's, there was a, a fair amount of talk about the marine planning um, business today and uh, ocean energy development and, and uh, those sorts of things. So just, just to point out, we do have that agenda item here. Uh, we have already expanded it. 
uh, to include the uh, some information on aquaculture area mapping as a result of the discussions earlier this week. So, um, so that is there. Uh, we do plan to have BOEM come and, and present to the council under that agenda item. Um, under Monday, March 8th, the Pacific Whiting Treaty implementation, again, the, uh, the meeting of the uh, Whiting Treaty folks doesn't occur until after the March meeting, so we pushed that off to April. Um, for Tuesday, March 9th, um, the uh, HMS business, Swordfish Mon Management and Monitoring Plan, we did, uh, that's shaded, that's a two hour agenda item. We did hear from the management team, their recommendation to push that uh, out until uh, November. Uh, we did add the deep set Uyghur permit uh, clarifications. So uh, this is the terms and conditions of the uh, limited entry permit. So we added that in for an hour. We got two, or, uh, so March is our usual ecosystem business. So we've got uh, California current ecosystem on Wednesday. And then we've got two shaded ones, the climate and communities initiative update. We are expecting to have some um, virtual workshops to look at the scenario planning exercise. Um, over the course of the winter, so that's that's progressing. So this would be it seemed like the best opportunity opportunity to have all the ecosystem folks uh, available to comment on that. And then uh, likewise, we've been working on the fishery ecosystem plan five year review update, <coughs> um, kind of progressing stepwise through the sections of that. <coughs> so that that's what I've that's what I've got right now. So again, if we, um, you know, we were talking seven and seven and a half hour days for the most part. Um, if we uh, eliminated the swordfish, that would give us a couple hours we could di distribute around. And if we eliminated the regional operating agreement, uh, that would uh, give us another hour. Um, for the mothership utilization scoping issue, we've got uh, three hours. Um, and uh, so you know, I, I think uh, so. I, I think three hours is probably too much if it was just scoping. Uh, but again, under this agenda item, I think you know, development of alternatives, at least uh, you know whether that's a uh, adopting a range for public review or uh, or just uh, getting some um, you know getting some feedback on on some ideas. Uh, um, I think uh, we would. Uh, I think three hours would would uh, accommodate some of that, some of those types of discussions. So I think I'll just pause right there and see uh, see if there's some reaction to that stuff. Ryan, thanks, Chuck. Just a clarification: you want reaction on just the ones you you raised, or the the whole March agenda? Uh, it's, I think it's all all fair game. Uh, the rest, the stuff I didn't mention, is largely, uh, you know, uh, routine management items. But uh, um, okay. so I didn't didn't go into detail. But yeah, they're all fair game. Okay. Um, well, I'll start with a few minor things. You touched on. You mentioned the Sam and Nims report. Yes, uh, Barry would like to come and speak to the council on the Columbia Basin Partnership Task Force. Uh, I don't think that would extend the NIMS report more than another 30 minutes. Um, for uh, highly migratory species issues, um, I think you'll see both here and my other comments, we pretty much are aligned with the MT report. Uh, so when it comes to the March agenda, that would involve moving swordfish management and monitoring plan to the November 2021 spot on the YAG for the reasons outlined in the report, uh, as well as I think we'll have additional um, data uh, from EFPs uh, that can contribute uh, by that time, or by this time next year. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate part, but I'd also we'd also support all of the SSC related meetings over the winter prior to this March meeting, <clears throat> as well as the um, 
advisory body requests on, on spacing things out and scheduling that you've seen in their reports. For electronic monitoring, um, <clears throat> I do think it would be very helpful to have an EM agenda item in March so that we could consult, or at least bring back to the council, the program guidelines and manual for 2022. Um, they do directly require us to do, develop this in consultation with the council and we'd be prepared to present those uh, in March um, if the council wants to review them. The, we are expecting one to two GEMPEC meetings over the winter, potentially a webinar as well, uh, that council staff are working out on scheduling. So all of that would uh, help lead to the uh, work needed to prepare for that proposed agenda item. In coming to groundfish, and, and I started with the low hanging fruit <laughs> for your request, Chuck, but um, I think I need to be clear here, although we're talking about the March agenda, this is going to be um, NIMS position for the rest of this discussion as well. I think we were pretty clear when I discussed groundfish workload under, under that agenda item as well as Barry under his presentation. Um, not just groundfish, really our entire division across the board for the next six months is, is focused entirely on fulfilling our, our statutory obligations, our legal obligations, and our treaty obligations. And, and I, wanna, I wanna begin this by saying how, how proud I am and how impressed I am by our staff and how much work they have been able to get done while operating uh, under very challenging situations with plates that continue to grow, not shrink during this time, uh, and stress and other external circumstances, which continues to exacerbate things, not ameliorate them. Looking at groundfish in particular, we, we, this branch has six permanent staff, five of which are analytical and regulatory, and we have a contractor. We already, in, in throughout our normal blind work, rely on staff and our other branches to help us out, things like EFPs, and, and we're losing staff capacity currently and potentially in the future as well as we try to um, deal with our, our vacant leadership position and we have folks stepping in and taking on that, which is an enormous workload on itself. So as we've noted, I don't expect that change or anything to change soon there. So I really hope that these overarching marks can, can be kept in mind and in context as I kind of walk you through here. On the Magnuson front, our priority is the specs, not just this specs package, including the NCs and adjustments at this meeting, but we have to start now on the next package for 23 and 24 because we preliminary determined we're gonna need potentially a whole new NEPA structure. We also need to engage council staff on the primary stable fish program catch your review on the treaty front working on the separate whiting specifica specifications pass package as well uh, along with the ESA driven requirements for the same and bycatch mitigation measures rulemaking the non troll logbook uh, and then folks starting discussions for the next steps on the humpback buy-up and, and the ESA work group coming up and all of this at a time where um, clearance, review, publishing at the headquarters level uh, is expecting serious delays and uh, uncertainties related to um, uncertainties related to uh, how much the next administration will get engaged uh, and whether or not that will cause additional delays. So after all of those things I just listed, we will engage in, in limited capacity in, in the SAMTAC gear switching and widening mothership utilization issue because it's our understanding, at least at present, pending further discussion that those are the council's selected priority actions. But that is, that is about the best case scenario that we think that we can get uh, some engagement there on the first portion of 2021, but after that, it's going to be till the latter half of 2021 at best before we can engage on on an on-trial RCA, Emily Platt, or, or other actions. Uh, however, 
if we get a permanent branch chief on board uh, and things change um, by the time we hit our spring meetings, um, we will obviously reassess and be reporting and having that dialogue with you. So how this plays out then for the March agenda, um, on a more minor note, we would like to have an agenda item. It doesn't have to be March. It could also be April. But like I said, we we did commit in the humpback biological opinion as part of that um, terms and conditions to come back and work through those through the council with industry. Uh, so we would like an hour or so to be able to update on the buy up the full ITS and how we might move forward uh, with the council and with industry on the related terms and conditions. Again, that could be March. Um, also happy to do that in April, but I think sooner rather than better due to some of the time uh, requirements in the biome. Finally, on um, on the mothership issue, I'm, I'm sensitive to all the comments that we've received. I, I understand the importance of the issue. I just, again, NIMS at this time has very limited ability to engage in this action. Uh, it's not just our groundfish branch. This would involve engage, engagement from our permits branch, which is taxed, our salmon branch, which as you well know is entering in uh, to that March, April heavy salmon season. Um, so. Our priority will be, if this remains on the agenda, working on just some clarity to provide the council with regard to implications for the salmon buy-up and also the Whiting Treaty uh, tax setting process uh, from the proposal to move up the start date of the Whiting fishery. For example, does that mean a reinitiation of our salmon opinion or not? We believe that's the necessary step to inform the direction uh, based where it wants to go with this action and, and, and if it's even going to consider setting a range of alternatives. And, and, I, and I echo your comments earlier, Chuck, that you know, our, our understanding was the same as the decision summary document from September that, that you referenced, that this item would benefit from further scoping you know, to at least impart to the mismatch between the adopted purpose and need and the discussed proposals relative to which widening sectors they would affect. So. At this point, NIMS cannot commit much more on this action than what I just said. Uh, however, I'm not necessarily advocating um, removing from the agenda, uh, especially as it's noticed as scoping in the quick reference. And I believe at least for March, that is my conclusion of my remarks. Thanks, Brian. Um, so, so just just to clarify, so uh, so the additions that you mentioned, I think, were was uh, and thank you for reminding me the electronic monitoring uh, agenda item where the council would have an opportunity to weigh in on that uh, guidelines and um, and uh, manual, and then uh, sometime in. Was it March or April for a humpback biop update? That's one I didn't quite catch. Neither. Either. Okay. And uh, so I asked I asked Brett about the electronic monitoring issue, and he said that would be an hour and a half to two. Uh, do you have any guess as to what the humpback update might be? Or biop? Yeah. Our guess is one hour, at least just to provide the update and discuss what potential next steps may be. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other thoughts or comments about March? John Ugaritz. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, mirror what Ryan said regarding highly migratory species. Uh, I support moving the swordfish management and monitoring plan to November. The addition of deep set buoy gear permit clarifications. And I think the biennial management measures uh, does need to stay. It could probably be shorter, um, but uh, it should definitely be there, unlike what the advisory sub panel. Did. I agree with that. Hey, Chuck, it's Mark. I can't raise my hand. Go ahead. I have none to raise. Um, I just wanted to comment on, I think most of the times seem reasonable. 
But I was looking on Friday, March 5th, the marine planning update and aquaculture area mapping. Given the amount of interest we've seen in that topic, um, I'm wondering if an hour and a half is really uh, realistic. Um, it seems like two or two and a half would be, um, and especially it being on a Friday evening, um, uh, I don't know. It seems like we need a, a little more realistic time there. Maybe I'm alone. I, I I don't think you're alone. I think, you know, considering the discussion we had under the previous agenda item, and I think, uh, you know, that, that uh, was not, I guess, uh, fully contemplated uh, when we made these estimates. So, um, <clears throat> Pete. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Um, just not asking to have anything deleted or removed, but thinking about efficiency and how we use the time allotted there. Uh, you mentioned under C2, the research and data needs update, uh, a, a discussion we had, and just for background, I, I had looked at that um, informational report, um, and my question to the SSC, which Mr. DeVore then responded, there's, there's some decision points that will come before us at that time if we keep it on the agenda and to keep it within that one hour, there's sort of the structural technical aspect of the database, which um, being optimistic, I, I don't expect a lot of issues there, but as I read that informational report, some of the decisions the council will be faced that on administration of the database and assigning priorities to different things and how that could happen. That's where I saw the real potential um, because there's so many opportunities to prioritize and, and a number of them were identified in there that we, our discussion could really go off into a number of different directions. So to contain it within that one hour that um, maybe, you know, you just carry the message back or, or the SSC and the database team would hear it that kind of look at that prioritization aspect, how it's done and allow or bring back something that really focuses the council's attention to the important aspects of that, maybe some examples of what were done. I mean, I, I don't want to dictate what they do. I appreciate what's in the report, but um, to try and narrow that so we don't spend a lot of time hashing out different prioritization schemes. So that's all I wanted to say there. On the mothership utilization, I, you know, I hear the issues there and I, I'm caught between the side about um, just additional scoping um, or range of alternatives. And with the time there, I guess, I, I don't know what, what all we would accomplish in one or two or three hours, but that it would set us up well in the future to take the next step on a range of alternatives and be efficient in our time utilization there. So you, we don't have multiple scoping sessions um, because we have so many things already identified there, some sort of priority issues to look at. You ran through the list that, again, if, if we're not getting to specifying a range of alternatives that we use the time and even if it's only two hours to set us up for some real efficiency and be very clear as we step into the future. So um, oh, one, one other thing I wanted to mention and I, and I just wanna put a placeholder in maybe when we're all done with this uh, discussion about meeting planning, it, it's uh, item C4, the marine up planning update and mapping. I, I have a a mapping item I'd like to present very briefly to the council, but that could be taken up much later uh, when we're all done with this business. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks, Pete. Uh, 
Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Just a couple quick thoughts on um, Monday under E2, the reintroduction above Grand Coulee. Um, I'm not sure what what that is. Uh, I don't know what all is happening over the winter months here on that topic. And I'm just um, kind of wondering if that's could if the people that are engaged in that could write a informational report for us rather than take up more time as an idea. I don't know if that's a possibility. On Friday under G1, um, I would certainly hope we could get the uh, IPHC report done in less than an hour in like 30 minutes. The report itself, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do another write-up report and touch on that. That shouldn't take but a few minutes and allow for a little bit of council discussion as needed in any public comment we might have. But essentially, the deed will have been done, whatever it is, by then. Um, on Monday, under the H4, the utilization issue, um, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm a, um, I, I understand every, well, I think I understand what people's different perspectives are. Um, you know, the industry has really developed the, the, the alternatives. Uh, they were, I went to them, I was invited to one of their meetings here a year and a half ago or so, and that's, you know, coming out of that. Uh, at really the council's request, they came back with the, with some alternatives and the, to the extent that we could make a step forward, uh, and if there is room um, in the manner in which this is agendized so that we have the all, the option to move forward with a range of alternatives given the amount of time that the, really the four of them have been out there, it seems to me that'd be a reasonable uh, thing to consider. Um, that's all I have, thanks. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I did uh, want to, Touch bases on that uh, reintroduction above Grand Coulee. So, uh, as, as I recall, we did get a presentation on that uh, finally, and this this agenda item was to uh, develop a response. I think they were looking for some um, position from the council that that uh, they could use to, um, you know, advance that. Uh, advance that concept so so i think so this isn't just an informational report this is this is where the council we already had that this is where the council would uh, develop a response um well it'd probably take longer than 30 minutes then if that's what we're going to try to do yeah well i, I suppose that would depend on how, how uh what, what we get in the advanced briefing book and um uh, how much people can work in advance on that. Of course, that being said, as uh, Ryan mentioned, this is a uh, pretty heavy workload time for salmon folks. Um, okay, uh, Krista. Yeah, thank you, Chuck. I wanted to say that I'm appreciative and supportive of adding uh, deep set buoy gear permit clarification to the March agenda. Um, super appreciative of the public, including Dr. Sepulveda and the environmental community for raising this issue and um, interested in seeing how that conversation develops. I'm also in agreement with others and the HMSMT about moving um, sort, the swordfish management monitoring plan to November. And I want to just highlight a couple of issues that I think we do need to think about when we bring that up. Um, we have a nascent recreational fishery um, and making sure that those voices are included in the process, I think will be really important. Um, you know, obviously swordfish is a big deal. And I mentioned in 2019 that we're currently working at 6.7% of our potential and have the possibility of generating a $76 million fishery if we can all work together to, to create that vision of, of what success really looks like. Um, and then I, I did want to just pause for a moment um, around some of the comment on items like 
picking up DGN might not make sense because there aren't very many vessels now and there are likely to be fewer in the future. And I really want to caution about using low vessel count as a reason for not having a conversation or delaying a conversation. Um, if we use that kind of measurement, uh, we would be penalizing the whiting fishery, for example, which had 27 vessels participating in 2019. Um, and I think that would be a shame because they brought in $64 million value that year. Um, but more than that, they brought in 380 million pounds to our docks, creating jobs in our communities and a high quality source of protein, you know, for both domestic and international markets. Um, so while I'm not suggesting that swordfish as a category is going to be harvested by only a few vessels, I do think that spending time uh, working on a comprehensive plan that is inclusive of all of our fisheries will create a similar path for us um, in light of the price point of swordfish and the biomass that is potentially out there for us to to work towards capitalizing on. Um, and I, I really believe that will strengthen the resiliency of our fragile coastal fishing infrastructure um, and that we really need that diversity both in our fleets and in our fisheries. So with that, I will say thank you for letting me pipe in. Thanks, Krista. Heather. Thanks, Chuck. I, um, Phil and, and Pete both talked a little bit about um, what I was thinking on the mothership utilization agenda item. I, I, I'm on the same page as what I heard from them. Um, I think industry did a lot of work to get this down the road. And I know um, our GMT folks and Jesse um, got together after the September meeting uh, to work on this and plan to do the same thing after the Thanksgiving break. Uh, so I hope that, um, I think it's it's smart to keep the mothership utilization on the agenda for the three hours um, described and in notice um, for ROA, even if during the conversation we aren't able to get to ROA. I think what Pete said about um, using the time we have efficient, efficiently makes a lot of sense. Okay, thanks. Bob. Thanks, Chuck. I, I just want to reiterate what Phil and, and Heather and, and, the, and Pete had said. I think the mothership sector came forward. We asked them to work in an ad hoc basis within the gap to come up with a a way to expedite the process. We have visited in September the alternatives. We actually, you know, rejected one, or, and we've kind of refined that range of alternatives that they, they suggested. There seems to be a lot of agreement on this, <clears throat> and I, I look at how this affects the uh, the the future agendas as if we limit what can happen in in March. That I, you know, I'm looking to clear this off the. <clears throat> off the docket and <clears throat> make room for things like, you know, the non-trawl RCA to get done because that's equally as important. They're all, all these things are important. So let's, uh, you know, I, I realize there's some issues that Ryan pointed out, but I don't, I'm not so certain and would benefit from maybe a education on that a little bit, but I'm not so certain we can't deal with these as the options are, 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 are analyzed and refined. There will, there's always bumps in the road, but let's let's move forward and try to get a range, a goal of getting a range of alternatives at least going forward out of the March meeting. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, all right, well, uh, I've heard a few good ideas here. Um, we've uh, had suggestions to add uh, a couple things. Uh, I've had suggestions to delete a couple things. It's. Uh, I think we're probably um, net neutral, or maybe a little added a little more than we took away. Um, so, uh, I guess to the extent that uh, people are comfortable with with those sorts of uh, uh, day lengths. Um, uh, we, we could accommodate what's what's on the table. I guess if we're if we are looking for one more thing uh, that uh, you know to, to 
save some time. Um, I guess the one thing I would think and maybe uh, ask about is the, uh, the uh, on Wednesday, March 10th, the J3 ecosystem plan five-year review update. So I, I'm not sure that's essential. Again, if it's it's nice because uh, I'm sure there's people working on this and um, this is kind of an ecosystem meeting. We don't have a, typically have another uh, ecosystem meeting until September. Not that we couldn't uh, accommodate something um, in uh, in June if we if it was uh, time sensitive. But has there any been any thoughts about that, John Ugaritz? Yeah, thanks. I've just had a couple brief discussions with people on the ecosystem work group um, and my staff. I, I do think both those items need to stay on to continue momentum for ecosystem in March. However, I do not think the climate and communities initiatives needs a full two hours for the update. I think it could be much uh, shorter and more of an update than a discussion, um, but I would recommend keeping them both. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not hearing a lot of dis disagreement with uh, with with what we've had here. Uh, basically, so I'm just going to summarize real, real quick, and unless I hear otherwise, uh, this will be plan for March. Um, starting at the beginning, uh, research and data needs update. We're going to uh, ask for a focus on uh, prioritization process um, and trying to uh, keep keep the um, keep the discussion uh, pretty focused on what the councils uh, needs to weigh in on there um, <clears throat> I'm gonna add a little bit of time to the nymphs report uh, there's still some questions about the Grand Coulee dam response but uh, if that's if that's what it is and that sticks uh, it's possible we might need to expand that time a little bit for Friday, March 5th, there's uh, been a suggestion that the uh, Pacific Calibut IPHC report, um, I shouldn't say commercial report, uh, might an hour might be a little strong for that. So we'll take a look at that and see how we've done in the past with that and see if we can trim that back uh, or not. The marine planning update, uh, Given the discussion at the previous council, uh, previous agenda item, we're going to uh, add some time to that. So uh, that'll be perhaps two hours at least. For the for Monday on the mothership utilization, we're going to add uh, so it'll be scoping slash range of alternatives, and we'll keep it at three hours. Um, <clears throat> someplace in here, we're going to have to add an electronic monitoring agenda item. Yeah, uh, for an hour and a half or two, and a humpback biop update uh, for an hour. For Tuesday, March 9th, we're going to move the swordfish management and monitoring plan off until November. Uh, for Wednesday, uh, we're going to take a look uh, at the time estimate for the climate and communities initiative and see if we can trim that back uh, or not. But, uh, we'll have a discussion with staff and, uh, and the principals there, but hopefully that we can do that. And then uh, no changes for Thursday. So that's gonna put us pretty close to eight hour days uh, all week long on that, just, uh, just so folks understand that. I um, haven't quite done all the math, but that's, uh, that's my impression. So, uh, any objections to that? Seeing none, let's move to April. <clears throat> so, um, here in April, we've also got uh, seven or seven and a half hour days uh, across the board. Uh, the the new stuff is um, uh, just a little bit of change to the uh, sablefish business um, in terms of identifying the um, 
the objective there, which is to uh, uh, identify a maximum fixed gear attainment level. That's again broken up into two hours, uh, two uh, two parts, so successive days, um, six hours one day, and two the next. I I think we're going to need all of that. Uh, is my impression. I think that's a pretty uh, significant step. Um, seems to be a lot of discussion and um, a lot of public comment on that. So uh, I think that's important to keep that. Um, <clears throat> so that that's uh, really the big change. I guess we have fiscal matters uh, planned to be on there. That's when we expect to be able to hopefully adopt a, uh, an operational budget. That should be pretty quick. I'm not even sure if 30 minutes will, will it'll take that long. Um, the other sort of shaded items to discuss are uh, the CPS EFH phase one report. Um, that is a little bit past due uh, relative to the what we had scheduled, but uh, that was the result of some um, staffing issues, but uh, it should be ready to go at that point. Uh, for ground fish, we have the, uh, the, the trawl RCA and Emily Platt regulation scoping for, for three hours. Um, again, I, you know, the, I, I would point out that this was one of the things we committed to initiating, uh, according to, um, based on our response to executive order 13921. <clears throat> so I think we probably should keep that on there. We've got uh, Sant Coho uh, Endangered Species Act uh, consultation, so that that uh, so that is. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's a salmon. This is a salmon meeting. It's good to have salmon agendas. There's salmon items in salmon meetings. Uh, that is shaded, though. I think there is still room uh, to complete the process by November if that was was not on here, but uh, it gets pretty hard to get salmon fishermen into the council meeting in June. So um, let's just, uh, just take that into consideration. We talked about the sable fish uh, and we've got an update on executive order 13921. So that I think that's um, in addition to the uh, section four Magnuson Act uh, um, business, some of the other um, aspects of that uh, order just to kind of see where we stand. Uh, if there's anything involved with the uh, aquaculture opportunity areas and, um, and those sorts of things. So uh, so not <clears throat> not a lot of changes there really. Um, um, and I'll, I guess I'll open it up for discussion if there's any thoughts about uh, other items we need to uh, put into that, but um, Right now, it doesn't look too awfully bad. And Ryan? Thanks. Sorry, Chair, to cut out on me the first time. Yeah, I know. No, Sorry. Um, no worries. I actually don't have too much to uh, say here. Um, I would recommend, um, from our perspective, moving the ESA work group on Monday, April 12th, F2, um, from April to June. The team has requested that um, because they need more time to develop tax and fishing effort reports. Um, I think they want to move their meeting as well. So that's something we would suggest. That's really the only change. When it comes to um, gear switching, uh, just to be I mean, at least Updated again where NIMS is that when we have engaged, we have not engaged in the recent version of the analysis, nor have we finished evaluating all the committee developed alternatives for their implementation details or identified implementation deals related to uh, committee alternative three or any of the new potential alternatives. So we have some catch up work to do at this point, but as I noted earlier in my remarks, you know, this is one of those uh, items at the top of our list uh, if we get additional time uh, with our staff beyond uh, meeting those core priorities I mentioned earlier. So we can't commit much more than this, but, but we do think that 
that would support council adopting of gear switching limits or potentially adopting to further inform selection of an ROA um, as they discussed earlier this week. So probably for that to stay on the agenda, just noting that once the council does select an ROA, we, we will have to undergo formal NEPA scoping and can't say at this point, especially in light of the new regulations, what the required level of analysis will be. And once we have that determination, we'll be much better, we'll be in a better position to respond to the full scheduling of the, the, the subsequent steps for council action. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Brett. Thanks, Chuck. I had some uh, comments and a suggestion, but before I embark uh, down that path, quick question for Mr. Wolf. Did I hear him correctly that he's recommending moving the Sonk Coho workgroup item to June from April? Um, Chuck, Chuck uh, thanks, Brett, for the question. No, the Endangered Species Work Group on um, Brownfish F2. Yeah, Brett, and just, just to clarify, I, I'm, I did mention that, uh, that it would theoretically be possible to still get all the steps in if, if, that, was, if that was moved, but, uh, but that it would be better to keep it in April. So go ahead with your other comments, Brett. Thanks, Chuck. So, uh, and thank you, Mr. Wolf. I wasn't sure if you were, what you were recommending there. Um, so not, not surprisingly, I've made comments uh, consistent with, you know, what I'm going to say here now prior to this. And um, so not surprisingly, my recommendation is going to be to move that sonk coho item from April to June. Um, and I have a, a number of reasons for that. While I, I do recognize the logic uh, behind having this particular item on the April agenda, um, <clears throat> I think there are some overriding factors that that um, that we should consider. Uh, first and foremost is that the March and April workload for uh, members of the STT who are also members of this work group and other key staff, um, at least from the state of California, uh, is very substantial. Um, it's going to be quite difficult for the work group to make progress uh, between Jan, you know, really now and April on uh, the work that needs to get done such that uh, we could have a substantive discussion in April on this particular issue. And, it, and, and it, the, the work, the progress on that work may slow to uh, slow down substantially or even grind to a halt um, in the months between now and then, in particular, January through uh, this April meeting. Um, you know, and, and that's a, that's a normal, uh, normally a very difficult um, and cumbersome process as everyone knows uh, salmon management cycle is is very difficult and demanding on time we have very little to no wiggle room on those work products um, and adding this to the plate uh, is not trivial um, <clears throat> to add to the difficulty of of what is normally a very challenging process we of course have limitations associated with covid uh, staff capacity and workload are issues for the state of California, similar to uh, what Mr. Wolf described for the National Marine Fisheries Service, where we're completely um, obligated at this point in time to meet our standard priorities. Um, and I think that given the fact that there's wiggle room here, uh, it does make some sense to move it. In, in addition to the COVID and the you know, workload and capacity issues, um, the 2021 management cycle is going to be further uh, challenged by some of the data gaps um, that we reported on earlier in this council meeting for the state of California. There are real implications for that um, that have yet to be resolved. Resolved and those will, those, those, you know, resolutions are going to add to what will otherwise be um, like I've said, a really demanding process. Um, 
I also just want to point out that the Sonk work group is already behind behind schedule, um, largely due to those COVID uh, related, but also fire related uh, staff capacity and workload issues. Um, I don't, and, and as I said before, I don't expect a tremendous amount of progress to be possible uh, during the winter and early spring, given all of the other work that needs to occur um, to promulgate regulations for the 2021 fishery. So uh, I do think more time for the work group will be useful and likely lead to a better overall product um, and range of alternatives for the council to consider as preliminary preferred come June. Um, I, like I said earlier, I understand that avoiding summer months uh, is meant to optimize the availability of the SAS and other salmon uh, fisher uh, folks um, in the public, uh, but I don't think that that, um, that optimization uh, justifies further challenging the STT and those other key agency staff that I've spoken about during the management cycle, given all of these other considerations. Um, and then last thing I'll say that is that while, again, I totally agree with and recognize uh, the utility in avoiding summer months for uh, our salmon representatives and members of the public, I just have to note that there's a very plausible scenario in my mind uh, for the June meeting where we're meeting virtually again. And that should certainly facilitate easier participation for the salmon fishing public in the SAS. So um, I'll stop there, but my plea, to, my plea here is to consider moving this from April to June. It's not gonna disrupt the overall uh, schedule that um, and, and anticipated date of completion that we have laid out for this work group. And in all likelihood, it's going to facilitate a better overall product and eventual recommendation to NIMS. So, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Brett. Um, is there any uh, any anybody else have any thoughts about that? Uh, Sonk Coho business. My hand is up. Just, just, just a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm scrolled down, so I'm not seeing the hands up. I'm Brian, go ahead. I'll, I'll defer to Joe first. Joe. You have to unmute yourself. Joe, you're still muted. There you go. Okay, can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, thanks. And appreciate those points that uh, Brett just provided relative to uh, Sonk Coho. Uh, I, I haven't um, received any information from either Hoopa Valley or Yurok regarding uh, this matter uh, as it relates to the April agenda. Um, so that might uh might be necessary for me to to try and get some response and feedback from them on that um, but uh, uh given i might not be able to, to to do that um is there any consideration so if there's going to be any work between now and april that there could be some update or would there be a need to have some sort of update just uh inform folks as to uh, where things currently stand and not maybe spend the amount of time that's identified here. I guess I would have to defer to some members of the committee on that one. I can Ryan. Yeah. Ryan. Thanks, I, I can answer that, Chuck. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Joe, for the, the comment and the recommendation. That's actually very similar to what I was going to suggest. Um, well, I completely understand all of the, the points uh, that Mr. Cormos made and, and I'm very sympathetic on many, many angles for 
obvious reasons when it comes to workload and, and other issues in, in the heavy March and April um, work already in front of all of the salmon uh, folks. Uh, so my idea was very similar to yours, Joe, was to potentially change this maybe from ROA PPA to an update. At the very least, whether whether or not we have made traction in getting towards an ROA, at least evaluate to re allow us to reevaluate in March. But more importantly, if we were just able to have a placeholder to seek additional guidance from the council to help with this work, especially uh, with a relatively quick turnaround between April and the June meeting, that perhaps that might be a acceptable compromise and way forward. And then, of course, if it looks like we're not on track for uh, something of substance when we revisit it workload in March, we could address that then. Um, Joe, you have another comment? Oh, Brett. No, I do not. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Brett. Thanks, Chuck. And thank you, Joe and Ryan. Um, I, I would be supportive of changing this to an update. I I agree with the utility um, that you've described in, in doing that. And I also see that as taking a tremendous amount of pressure off of the work group and uh, those key folks that I talked about on the STT and with agency staff and actually creating the products that we would need to have for this to be a actual ROA or PPA type of an agenda item. If they can simply just update us on where things stand at that point in time, um, I think we've done uh, the right thing and uh, keep it keeping it on the radar and giving the council an opportunity to hear how things are progressing and maybe offer guidance. I, I think that's appropriate as well. So. Thanks very much. Okay, that sounds like a way forward. Um, and, and I'm assuming we're not gonna need two hours to do that. So I, I don't know if uh, half an hour or one hour. Um, Brett, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, thanks Chuck. I, I, I would guess 30 minutes will suffice, um, but again, I'm. <laughs> emphasize that I'm guessing uh, uh, the the update shouldn't take long. I, I'm not sure what council discussion might occur or not. Um, I guess that's where I'm sort of scratching my head about 30 minutes versus an hour. Maybe more like 45 as a compromise, but we I don't see that 45 minute. Um, you know, that very, very, very often. often. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, and then, I, you know, and this is, again, something that uh, we can touch on at the end of the March meeting, too. And if we need to expand the time frame or uh, postpone it altogether, we could do that uh, at, um, at the end of the March meeting. So, okay. So, is there anything, any other um, issues, Maggie? Thanks, Chuck. I am looking at the F5 item cost recovery report, which is uh, reminding me of uh, the council discussion earlier this week about considering reconstituting the cost recovery committee. Mm -hmm. I'm looking for some productive way to move forward on the issues there. Is that something we need to or should discuss now and plan for? <laughs> Yes, I, I I think that's uh, I think that would be a good time to do that. You know, so we did up the time estimate from one to two hours because, you know, initially it was the kind of the traditional cost recovery report and, uh, but also some action on revising uh, kind of minor revision to the regs, but um, but uh, we did up it to. Um, because of the discussions that went on this week in regards to possibility of, uh, of uh, repopulating the, the committee or doing some additional um, work on that topic. So, but uh, yeah, please continue. Well, thanks. Uh, I, I think that um, answers the question that I hadn't really framed as a question, but if, if that would be, 
uh, one of the items for council discussion under the F5 item, uh, I, and then what would be the pathway if, if there is a decision to uh, bring back that committee and refresh it? Uh, would we be looking at action under the membership appointments at the April meeting or a future meeting? Just trying to make sure that we, you know, we have a plan to move forward and that lines up with the, the appropriate timeframes this year. Uh, yeah, so uh, we could do that under uh, the April membership appointments and COPs. Uh, we could do that there. Uh, provided there's you know sufficient time to um, make sure everybody that wants to be on it uh, knows about it and can be on it and those sorts of things. But um, yeah, I, I think I think it could be done again if there's enough uh, advance uh, work on that. You know, if if it's just too quick, uh, it is an ad hoc committee and. Um, so, uh, and as long as the committee is already established, so if we need to, uh, we could certainly uh, just rely on the chair's authority to make appointments uh, after the council's is, has adjourned in April, if we don't want to wait all the way till June on that. Thank you for that information. Ryan. Yeah, thanks Chuck, and thanks Maggie for raising that. Um, uh, I was hoping that would come up at some point, uh, at least from NIMS's expectation, um, this is how we would see this playing out. Um, I would hope that in March, under the groundfish prioritization, the workload management agenda item that cost recovery has noted during discussion at this meeting would be part of that discussion, uh, helping to identify where it falls in the, in the various groundfish priorities. And then in April, under A5, just as, as Chuck had noted, we would have our, our annual cost recovery report. Um, uh, as, as a reminder, this would be final action on that on that reg change to, on the at sea metric to Pacific Whiting only that we discussed earlier. Uh, and at that point, uh, if it's prioritized, uh, the charge to the committee based on that discussion and the, and the chair's decision on how to proceed for appointments, whether it's through the way you just outlined, Chuck, or through the separate appointment agenda item. And then, of course, uh, again, when we said our availability for two meetings, our, our best case projection at this point in time would be if that is all prioritized and appointed and goes forward along those lines, we would see the Cost Recovery Committee meeting twice between the August and December timeframe. Okay, thanks. Any other discussions? Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Executive Director. <laughs> um, couple of things. Um, appreciate the discussion we're having here. Um, want to acknowledge Ryan's remarks on the need for the humpback um, item, um, whether it be March or April, I guess I don't have an opinion. Um, but just to note that if NIMS is ready to give us a one hour update, um, I, I think the sooner we do that, the better, um, acknowledging that uh, there may be a need for additional agenda items into our future. Um, on that topic. So um, if they're ready, um, I'm hearing they're not ready <laughs> to proceed on a number of other items. So um, I think um, scheduling this one sooner is, is a good idea. Um, appreciate NIMS's overall remarks on their capacity uh, that we've heard throughout the week. Um, we agree and understand that um, some slowing down is going to be necessary in the council's planning. Um, also really wanna acknowledge um, the GMT report um, in describing for us what their plans are for their January winter meeting and the need to focus on NEPA and how that will integrate into our 
specifications process for the next cycle and um, what work will need to be done um, in uh, rebuilding um, the NEPA document uh, for the future so that it best meets, meets our management needs um, and analytical needs moving forward. So I see that being a very major lift on NIMS and the GMT staff uh, into the next year. So um, I, I'm very mindful of that and mindful that overall our specs are right there at the top of our list to accomplish our MSA objective. So um, I can appreciate the need for that to be the major focal point of uh, NIMF staff um, in the spring and beyond. Um, that said, um, with regard to what is shown as F3 right now, um, the non troll RCA and Emily Platt EFP item into regulations, I, I would very much support this item being unshaded. Um, as you mentioned, Chuck, in your um, remarks overviewing the April agenda, um, the this item was actually two. Um, an item, it was the uh, two items. It was the Emily Platt EFP into regs and non troll RCA um, as two separate priority items uh, that we heard from the gap were the top of the top priorities, along with the mothership utilization item. So um, we've had some discussion and some scoping on mothership. Um, I would just like to ensure that we have equal time for this item. Um, now, so I would support us unshading this item um, just so uh, everyone um, maybe is aware about our our thoughts, how this would uh, proceed um, in in light of the gaps statement under workload. Um, I had a brief exchange there with um, Susan Chambers on some of the ideas that the gap discussed about packaging this item. Um, as the uh, the item describes right now, the, the, the magnitude of what all is in that, <laughs> that item, um, I believe is too big. Um, I don't think we can realistically tackle non troll RCA and Emily Platt in one action. Um, but we, um, CDFW with our California GAP representatives from the OA and the LE sectors will be working with our enforcement staff over winter to, I think, refine and narrow uh, the scope of what this item might look like and bring that report back to the council in March for the discussion that would be scheduled under the groundfish prioritization item. Uh, that we will discuss in March. So um, I think all things considered, the three hour time estimate for scoping on this item is, is as good as any guess we might have. Um, but that's, that's our thought is that we work to narrow this and have it be um, one bite of this very major series of items. So, that's that's our thinking, and again, we appreciate the support and um, moving ahead with unshading this item. Um, looking at F4, the sable fish item where we identify max fish fixed gear attainment level. Um, really appreciate the council's work on this topic, this meeting, um, and the fact that now we can focus on that one, I think, singular item about an attainment level. Um, this looks great. I, I guess I just might um, offer that, <laughs> can't believe I'm saying this, but possibly we may not need eight hours to uh, discuss that one singular issue and identify a max attainment level. Um, I don't have an alternate suggestion, but just, um, think maybe um, with the good work we did this meeting that um, it might bring some time efficiencies for next meeting. Um, on the executive order item, 
I one um, appreciate what the plans are for this. Uh, might suggest that we think about if there will be a need to update this discussion to include other executive orders that might be in play by April. Um, I think we'd be interested in hearing about any others. So um, just maybe suggest consider broadening that description a little bit. Um, just overall wanted to remark too that um, with regard to the November council meeting, I, I can't tell you what, <laughs> what a pleasure it's been uh, in terms of the time scheduling and the uh, feasibility of the work days. Um, it's gone really, really well from our perspective. Um, so thank you to the efforts of the council staff. I think they do a good job um, keeping us on track and adequately assessing the, the time allotments for the items and having us have manageable work days. Um, looking at both March and April, I if if the time estimates are right, I, I think that works, that will work for us. It, it did this meeting, it worked great. Um, and I guess part of that um, success too is maybe um, owed to having the GMT continue to have meetings uh, prior to the council meetings um, a number of days in advance so that they can get their work um, well along before we take items up in discussion. So um, appreciate the recommendations of the GMT and support that planning going forward. It, it worked well. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Rihanna. Thanks, Jack. Um, I just wanted to offer support for F3 on April 9th to unshade APS EFH. That would be the other F3. <laughs> Let's see if we've got a labeling issue there, but yes, okay. Well, uh, it, well, any other comments real quick here or issues to bring up? If not, I've, I've got a, a couple suggestions. <clears throat> um, so we're, uh, well, maybe just to start on the, so the update on executive order 13921, um, I guess my suggestion there is rather than broaden it at this point, why don't we wait until March? Uh, the legislative committee is going to be meeting then. There will probably be some recommendations, and that's something that we could do uh, without too much, <clears throat> uh, hopefully without too much difficulty um, at that at that stage and uh, with a lot more uh, knowledge rather than sort of raising expectations that we're going to cover all you know, a potentially broad sweep uh, at this point. Um, so th that would be my suggestion there. Um, then, uh, you know, uh, I, so as far as unshading things, uh, I think everything in, in April could be unshaded and, and fit within the time frame here. And in fact, um, I was, it seems like we're doing a little better in April than we are in March. So I was wondering about uh, people's feelings about maybe moving a, a March thing or two up into April. And uh, one of the most, Marcy already mentioned the humpback biop and she suggested that it would be better to have it sooner rather than later in March. But uh, but uh, I, I thought I would toss that out there as something that, um, you know, we could move up uh, into April. The other thing that uh, we might be able to, uh, thing or two, maybe we could move up into April um, would be uh, the, reintroduction above Grand Coulee Dam response, and then also possibly the uh, research and data needs update. Um, just to sort of give a little better balance, you know, to kind of seven hour, maybe try and get them seven and a half hours for both meetings instead of seven hours in April and eight hours in March. So uh, just, just kind of a, interested in hearing people's thoughts about that. Maybe that's something we, you know, unless there's some, uh, you know, particular priority as as Marcy expressed about the humpback 
I'll back by up. Um, you know, staff could just kind of massage those two as you know after we leave here to uh, fit fit things in uh, and make the time uh, make the time sort of more equitable between the two meetings. Brian. I support your staff massaging, and uh, yes, the humpback biop is either one we think is fine. So uh, I'll leave that to your discretion. We're prepared in either month. Okay. Mark. I just raised my hand to support as well. Okay. Uh, all right. Any other thoughts about March or April? All right. Well, I'm going to call those good. Uh, hopefully, Mike is uh, tracking and isn't pulling his uh, long hair out these days uh, with, with what we're doing here. So, uh, Mike, if you've got any comments, feel free to chime in. Mike Berner. Uh, no, I've been following along, and uh, I think things are going well so far. Thanks. Okay. Uh, then I'd, I'd like to just touch on the year at a glance a little bit. <clears throat> um, there, there's not not too much to do here. Um, I think I've uh, already kind of highlighted the, you know, the, the changes here. Um, um, uh, so just to mention, we are planning on moving the um, <clears throat> uh, HMS uh, Swordfish Management Monitoring Plan to November. Um, Let's see the oh, drift kill net hard cap scoping to June. Um, limited CPS methodology review in June. Move the whiting implement, implementation. Uh, and then uh, again, the, uh, the um, Sacramento and Klamath conservation objective review and Sacramento Falls Chinook age structured assessment. Again, placeholders in September. Um, again, we heard quite a bit of interest in uh, in preserving those, although they I don't think they'll be ripe for uh, council action in reality for for a while. But uh, we'll keep moving those out. Um, seems like there was something else I wanted to say about those, but I can't recall what it was right now. So um, so I guess I'll let it let it rest there, unless other people have comments about the year at a glance they would like to bring up. Pete. Thanks, Chuck. Um, just one thing, and I don't know if this warrants year at, a, year at a glance. Hopefully there's some radar screen out there where we can put it, but we heard in the public comments about the short billy rockfish prohibition on directed fishing. Mm -hmm. And when we went through that short billy issue a couple months ago, I mean, it, it was in the back of my mind and probably others, what is the potential for directed fishing? And, and I think people recognize it's slow. Um, it was brought up about um, fish meal for other things. And, you know, in the context of what else is going on now, aquaculture opportunity areas of Southern California and that, um, it, it's maybe not urgent, but something I, I do want to recognize, we heard that from the public and um, need to consider when it could be appropriate to take that up, whether or not we have to put it on this one year at a glance, if there were a year and a half or two year at a glance, you know, just that we don't forget that issue. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. And uh, I, I hope I'm getting predictable uh, because I'm gonna say that's a ground fish workload issue. And so it should, come up in terms of prioritization in March. And then we've got the June, September, and November uh, opportunities to add new topics and if necessary, reprioritize. So I, to me, that's that's uh, where that stuff belongs um, in getting weighed in against uh, all the other things that we're trying to balance. Maggie. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I, I certainly appreciate the intent of Pete's comments there and support it. And um, 
agree that it is something we should discuss in the context of ground fish workload. Um, a separate FMP uh, looking ahead, I would hope that um, we are able in June to get to the central stock of northern anchovy management framework that's shaded on there for a report now. Um, it sounds uh, like it's it's uh, you know likely to be ready for council uh, you know council floor at that time and um, you know this is something that there's there's quite a bit of interest in among the council and among our stakeholders and it'd be great to see that move forward so um, I don't know if that means necessarily unshading it at this meeting but I, I at least wanted to put that out there and, and signal that I would like to see it thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Well, uh, that's, you know, uh, everything's on the table right now, uh, all the way out to November. If the council is, um, you know, firm enough in their resolve that the, that they want to see that go forward and they're committed to June, then uh, we could do that. So um, we'll leave that up to the council to provide uh, some guidance on that. Ryan. Hey, Chuck. Um, not too much to add actually here, just to echo my earlier comments supporting the MT's report um, the, uh, for the HMS MT, excuse me, uh, in particular having the June uh, hard cap scoping issue also be ROA. I think we heard clearly for the team and NIMS to work uh, limiting our focus to management responses, et cetera. Um, so I think with that amount of time, we'll be prepared for both of those. Thanks. Okay, we can do that. Heather. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to um, go back to uh, what Marcy brought up on the, um, the anchovy framework report. And um, I think there's interest in that too. I agree. And, and just wondered if we in April might be able to talk more about what the scope of, of that item in June would be. Do we have an answer for Heather? Maggie. Well, thanks, Chuck. I'm not sure who uh, we were hoping for an answer from, but I will chime in that I would be happy to talk more about the scope of, of that item uh, in April. Okay, I think um, it, it is in the um, Coastal Project Man Management Team's um, statement. And uh, so they, they were just asking to have guidance on its workload over the winter so they, they knew you know, where to focus on near to glance for, for planning in April 2021 or in June. So this was just coming from their statement. Right, so the, yeah, their statement says that they think the schedule looks good the way it was. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I think, so I think in terms of getting to it, um, they're in agreement, I, I think, but as I, I think Heather was asking what the scope of the, that agenda item would be relative to uh, whether it's the, the management framework or some uh, something else. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and even, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Chuck. And even suggesting we could talk about that in April as well. Yeah. It, it, judging by the silence around the around the virtual table. Uh, I think that's probably a, a good uh, a good approach. Uh, we can uh, have some more discussion and, and uh, input from the team and the AAS and um, maybe some offline discussions as well with uh, other council members. Thank you. Maggie. Well, thanks, Chuck. Uh, looking back at the management team report, I'm reminded that they are planning on a February work session. Um, and so it, it might be helpful 
for them to have a little more firm planning target. Um, with that in mind, I, I might ask if there are uh, objections from anyone to unshading that item in June. And if not, I would propose we do so. I'm not seeing any objections. Uh, I, I did hear from Terry that the um, uh, team is planning on working on the framework at its February work session. So it sounds like they're, uh, obviously, they, I'm sure they're planning on working on it if they thought the schedule was um, was acceptable, so. I think, uh, I think it's gonna become unshaded, that's what I think. All right, uh, any other discussion on the year at a glance? Okay, seeing none, uh, I guess it's kind of uh, going, going, gone for any more on March, April or year at a glance, Maggie. I'm glad I'm out of the tomato range. Um, just looking at more at the June meeting, the Sable Fish Gear Switching ROA shaded item, and thinking about the, reflecting on the comments from the National Marine Fishery Service on their expected ability uh, to engage. Um, I think clearly that's an item that's a lot of interest to our stakeholders. So if we are uh, able to provide any more information at this time on whether that's a realistic expectation for June or not. Uh, I think that would be great to do that. So I guess that really is a, a question for Ryan, uh, if they have um, some perspective at this point on what they expect to be able to accomplish for that shaded item in June. Uh, yes, thanks, Maggie, for the question. Um, I, you know, as I mentioned, we consider this at the top of the ground for priorities based on the council's, um, based on the way the council has set this workload. Um, you know, at this point, like I said, we we can't commit to too much more um, uh, on this item, but think that the way that it's set up for the April council action then followed by the June ROA that that um, you know is, is is okay at least from our point even if we have limited engagement I, I don't think that's a point necessarily to postpone uh, again I'll re re reiterate my earlier comment you know it's once the council selects an ROA and we really then get into formal NEPA scoping looking at that with the new CEQ regs, et cetera. I mean, at, at that point, once we really see the ROA and, and look at that aspect of it, will we really have a better understanding of what that means for workload and what we can actually potentially engage in and what the level of, of work will be? So that, that sounded like uh, at least leaving it in June, I mean, it's shaded, but uh, leaving it there would be acceptable correct okay. Peggy, you have more oh it, uh, yes just thank you um and i just wanted to be clear that i am not i was not suggesting unshading it I, I think that certainly is dependent on where we are able to get in april but i appreciate yeah. the information thanks yep. okay what else Well, not seeing, oh, Pete Hassamer. Thanks, Chuck. Nothing on any of these calendars. Just I wanted to come back and have a, a couple of minutes to talk about uh, some mapping when you think the time is right and if that's appropriate. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're at the stage that uh, we've, we're pretty much done with the agenda planning. So if there's other uh, workload issues that uh, people want to bring up, uh, now's a good time. All right, if I may continue then. Yes. Um, sure, I know people want to 
run out now when we're done and catch your virtual airplanes. But uh, very quickly, I, I want to make a request to the executive director that he and his staff talk about adding a, a page to the website, the council's website, for some quick access maps. And uh, maybe I want to use a visual example to show you why I think there's value in that. Sandra, I don't know if you, you are able to get to the SRKW map. Um, the If you have it, the other one. But um, that that's OK. Um, this in the SRKW process under F2, there was a map in there that had the, the salmon management zones, and it was really important to um, you know that whole process we were going through. But if you're if you go back to that report, it's on page six, it's figure two, and I was looking at that map, and in the document we produce, it's pretty much unreadable. You, you can't make anything out, and I tried a magnifying glass, and, and I printed it out, and it prints out even worse. So I went to Robin, reached out to Robin Elke um, for a higher resolution copy, and what you see on the screen is what she sent me. And, and Robin, if you can, or excuse me, Rob, uh, Sandra, if you can zoom in to the upper portion just so people get a better picture of that if that's uh, possible. Yeah, excellent, thanks. So so she sent me what she had uh, received from Mr. Kyle Addix and it, it supported my conclusion. There's a little uh, logo there that it was produced by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. You, you can't make that out um, on the original map. So anyway, as I was looking at that, I thought, you know, this this map, and, and while I'm talking, Sandra, just slowly just kind of scroll down so people can see other parts of that, and I'll keep talking here. There's a huge amount of information that's useful, and uh, I used to, I'm a map geek, and I used to save hard copies of this, tear it off the back of safe reports and preseason salmon reports. But um, to my knowledge, you can't get this map electronically anywhere else. So I thought if we had this quick access map and this one were there, that it would be useful to a lot of people. It was produced through our council process. It's in one of our documents, you know, and, and all of that could be logged in some metadata table along with access to the map, who created it, the creation date. But there's a lot of other maps uh, that fall under the same category. So so this could be there and during our meetings just to make it more efficient for everybody else if somebody's talking about the Humboldt South Jetty Horse Mountain Area Closure, you click on, on this link and pull up the map and there it is. Um, an, another example of maps is um, in March, I think it's still on the schedule, is the Marine Planning Update and Aquaculture Area Mapping and and in the context of that, um, I was looking at uh, some of our ground fish amendment 28 EFH conservation areas. If you want to look at those in uh, the San Francisco bite, um, there, there's a map you can, through a number of uh, links and redirections, you can get to one on the, on the NIMS website. But it, you know, unfortunately, it's just not very helpful in giving you any detail. And your only other choice is to go to some interactive mappers and take some time. So if, if there were a link to that, because, because so much of the stuff we talk about has some spatial context or spatial orientation, to just be able to quickly go to that website, the council's website, click on the quick access maps and, and get this Southern California bite groundfish EFH conservation areas. And, and when somebody mentions Potato Bank, you can go look and see where it is. So that, that's my request. It's not asking you to build a bunch of maps, but when things like this come up through our processes, that they get stored somewhere. So we have continued access to them and uh, even talk with the advisory bodies and management teams of, of what things um, might have been produced in the past that are readily available to post up there and, and I would trust uh, with the executive director and his staff that that they could do the screening to figure out what's appropriate relative to our tasks in the council, what maps are appropriate to have up there. So appreciate your time. Just 
hoping that, you know, if that happened, it might uh, save time in the future for a lot of us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Pete. Uh, we we do have a website committee that meets about once a week, and uh, they've got a, a list of uh, website improvements, so we can uh, put this on there and see how it uh, see how it does stacks up with other priorities. But we can uh, take a look at that. Okay, uh, Maggie. Thanks, Chuck, and, and thank you, Pete, for the suggestion. I just wanted to uh, say I think that's a great idea. It would be really helpful to council members and um, you know participants in our process, but also as a, a state agency representative, I am um, you know frequently asked by other stakeholders for maps and spatial references, and being able to direct them to these sources would be just fantastic. They're they're a great. Um, resources being produced, and so I, I love the idea of pulling them together into a, a you know, quick access maps section. Thanks. Yep, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to agree, and I think that as we get into um, the this this uh, House bill that's talking about, you know, closing off areas, it'll be useful to have maps at our disposal showing the location of, of existing conservation measures. Those maps are out there, but they're typically hard to find. So merely building an inventory of these high resolution maps that others can link to or access will, will have tremendous value. And it, I, I'm hoping that merely building that inventory will not take too much staff time. Uh, it may take some server space, but not too much staff time. Okay, we'll take a look at that. All right, is there anything else people want to bring up? Ryan. Thanks, Chuck, and I'll be brief. I know we're getting to the end of a very long week, but uh, it would be remiss if I didn't take this moment, and it's connected to workload and council planning, but I wanted to thank um, Keely Kent, uh, who has served admirably in our acting groundfish role for the past four months. Uh, throughout the September and November council meetings with lots of, of, of important ground fish issues uh, during a pandemic, um, a huge workload uh, in helping keeping the trades running and also supporting all the council dis discussions here. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't have the uh, ability to announce her successor at this point uh, will probably be next week or so, which I will communicate to the council that will be in the acting position throughout the March and April council meetings. Uh, but until then, just wanted to again thank her for all of her effort and support uh, throughout the process here. Thanks, Ryan. I, I would echo your comments. Uh, Julie's been great to work with, and uh, you know, as, as the uh, acting division chief. Um, I just hope uh, we haven't scared her off and that she's uh, been willing to throw her hat in the ring for a permanent, on a permanent basis. Okay, Mark, is, is that just a remnant hand up? Oh, yes, um, it's no longer there. Do we have anything else that we want to uh, talk about here the, this afternoon then before we adjourn? Anybody? I'm not seeing anything. So uh, I think it's time to draw this meeting to a close. And thank everybody for uh, good work uh, all week and today getting the agenda set. Um, that went, uh, went very well, I think. So thank you all for that. I guess with that, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, so moved by Butch, a seconded by Virgil Moore. I will not entertain any discussion. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Bye. Bye. And bye. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving, yep. Thanksgiving. Thank you. You soon.
Happy Thanksgiving, yes. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care, all. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>